But guys, uh, I, I, I don't think I've met most of you, if not all of you. Uh, and uh, that's because of this darn COVID thing. I, I had hoped to be with you today in person, but uh, as this COVID thing continues, obviously uh, we have to play by the rules. Uh, I'm Jerry Wagner, the Vice President of Business Development for Bathy Catoso, and uh, I'm glad to, to meet you all, and hopefully we'll meet you in person sometime in the very near future. Our uh, mission this morning, my friends, is uh, to go through the Toso Apex product, specifically uh, installation. Guys, I'm I'm always gonna be straight with you. Um, I am a very technical person. I am not sales oriented. And what I mean by that is uh, I speak very plainly. I I don't fluff things up or sugarcoat things. I kind of tell it like it is. Uh, Sometimes uh, (laughs) to the anger, of my employer, but uh, but that's okay. Uh, you know, I have to be true to myself. So, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you exactly what I love about this product and 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 there, there's much about it, but I'm also going to tell you where I think things can be improved and, uh, and give it to you straight throughout the day. Because I am a technical person, this obviously will be more technical based, but please um, don't zone out on me when there might be something that maybe doesn't apply to what you do at MCO. I, I assure you, just give me a moment or two, we'll move forward and there'll be something again that uh, is, is relevant to you, uh, no matter what your position at MCO. I, I think it's important, you know, salespeople, I think sometimes are their own worst enemy. They kind of pigeonhole themselves. Oh, I'm the salesperson. I don't need to know this. And and I, I think that's a disservice. Um, the more technical information you don't have to retain this. You just have to be aware of it. I think that's the most important thing we'll accomplish today is not so much, you know, you're retaining, but just your, your awareness of the many features and benefits and the technical aspect of the product, because it's all good. You can see guys, we have a lot of material to cover in a relatively short amount of time. I think I've plugged this to be about three hours. It may be two, it may be three, but probably somewhere with, within that uh, that spectrum. I come to you this morning, my friends, from the Toso Time Studio in Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. And if you're not familiar with Pennsylvania, Cumberland County is not the Amish country. We are rather the Mennonite country. And I always say the difference between the Mennonites and the Amish is that the Mennonites have voltage and combustion engines. I am sure there's much more to it than that, but uh, that's my kind of ignorant perception of it. But I will say this, uh, we are surrounded by Mennonite farmers here. Literally, our property is is literally surrounded by Mennonite farmers. And I don't use the word lovely uh, very often or certainly very easily, but they are the mo- most lovely people, uh, pretty people, physically, uh, uh, spiritually, uh, just wonderful neighbors. And they took my wife and I, which are a couple of transplanted New Yorkers and accepted us into their community. So uh, truly lovely people. Guys, uh, this is how we're going to handle questions today. And it's how I always handle questions. Once I do have an opportunity to come and visit you and do some training uh, for your customers, which I hope will happen sooner than later. Again, all COVID uh, um, dependent, but um, whether there's one person in front of me or a hundred people, I handle questions at two times. Uh, We'll take a break about halfway through. We'll, We'll take about a 15 minute break. When we come back from break, I'll take questions on the first half of the class, and then at the end of the morning, I'll take questions on anything at all. And I hope that works for you guys. Uh, it, it, it's really the way we had to approach it, especially in a webinar format, because it gets very dis, disjointed uh, if you guys just on mic at any time. Uh, so I, I want to be clear about this. I, I don't want anybody leaving here today saying, hey, you know what? I didn't have time to ask him a question. Stop it. You're going to have all the time you want. I'll hang with you as long as you want. I will make sure that I answer or at least address. I, I don't ha- always have all the answers, but I at least will address every question or concern that may come up. But we will do it at two specific times. I hope that all works for everybody. Hey, guys, uh, again, I, I had hoped to be with you. And whenever I am doing in-person uh, let me back up. I, I kind of have this rock star existence. And what I mean by this, I, I, I'm in a different 
state, different province, different country, uh, virtually every week. And before I leave Pennsylvania, I create these little quizzes for myself because I literally have to be reminded about where I'm going. But I also like to know a little bit about the uh, the culture of where I'm going. So I've tried to represent each one of you today. Uh, I had asked Kelsey, and she was a great help to me, uh, to uh, tell me where everybody was from. And I think you guys represent four or five uh, different uh, provinces, which is wonderful. And um, I know Bruce, I don't think he's signed on yet, but Bruce Passmore is in Ontario. So we're going to start with our first quiz, and it's an Ontario quiz, but everybody can unmike and participate in this. You don't have to be from an on Ontario. What singer, songwriter is from Ontario? And people, let me tell you, I'm not opposed to violence. I can reach through this camera and smack every one of you. If you don't get this one right, Please, this is the softball for the day. They only get harder from here. What singer-songwriter is from Ontario? Is it Mr. James Taylor? Is it Mr. John Denver? Is it Ray LaMontagne? Or is it Mr. Gordon Lightfoot? Come on, people, give it to me, unmute, and tell me the answer. Come on. I hear you, someone. Hello? <laughs> Oh my goodness! Come on, guys, don't start off so bad. Gordon, Gordon Lightfoot. There he is, of Gordon course. Mike. There it is. It's your Gordy, absolutely uh, a national treasure, I'm sure, for Canadians. I actually saw Gordy. Um, oh my gosh, it's probably it might be ten years ago already in Peekskill, New York. Um, he doesn't look like that anymore. <laughs> I think you'll agree. But uh, we're going to honor Gordy this morning, and uh, we're going to do something. This is the first time I've ever done this, guys, on a webinar. I, I do this when I'm in Canada in live presentations, and it's always a blast. I get everybody to sing. Now, there's no excuse for not every one of you to sing. Don't unmute your video. You can keep your video off so when, no one knows who's singing. But every one of you, I want you to unmute and sing along to one verse of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Come on, everybody. I can't wait to see and hear the recording of that. I hope that came through. I think that has the potential for being really, really cool. Well, you've got to admit, guys, you've never been to an HVAC training before that started with a sing-along. Come on. you got you got to give it up for that. Okay, guys, everybody mute again if you would be so kind. And uh, let's get into why you're really here. And that's the nuts and bolts of the Toso Apex system. Guys, I'll tell you quickly a little bit about myself. When I was a kid in school, I was a terrible student, textbook-wise, um, dyslexic by today's standards, who knows what else. But uh, when they put a wrench in my hand, that's when I excelled. That, that's when I really was the top of my class. And I'm still that way today, all these years later. For me to understand a product, to, quite frankly, I literally need to destroy it. <laughs> Well, I need to take it apart. And that's what I'm going to do with you right now. We're going to go through the anatomy of the apex. We'll start with the indoor unit. And guys, we'll start with the uh, the transformer. There, there is a, a 208, 230 to 24 volt transformer because the apex system, unlike our mini split systems, the apex system does utilize a 24 volt control system. So that's why that transformer 
is internal to the electrical box of the Apex indoor unit. We have our standard um, uh, terminal strips for power, both power to the uh, indoor unit but also our communication circuitry between the indoor unit and the outdoor unit. So we'll start with the communication circuit. We have the uh, Y terminal, which is our signal to the compressor. We have our B terminal. Guys, if you're taking notes, let this be the first note of the day. Something uh, different about the Apex indoor unit is that the uh, reversing valve is energized in the heat mode. And that's done through that B terminal that you see here. So first note of the day, uh, reversing valve energized in the heat mode through the B terminal. The W1 terminal is if you utilize the uh, electric power strip or heater kit, as we call it. And we'll talk about that. In fact, I'll show you that in some great detail as we move forward. Uh, and that is the signal for the uh, electric strip at W1 to power up. The R terminal is our 24 volt uh, power circuit. Our C terminal is our 24 volt common. And lastly, our G is our indoor unit fan signal to operate. All righty, uh, I mentioned briefly the electric hit key uh, kit which is available for the Apex. There are four sizes, my friends, or capacities, I should say, an 8KW, a 10, a 15, and a 20. And again, I'll get in great detail as we move forward here today. But if you and your customers are utilizing the electric strip heat, which I got to believe you guys are doing in your neck of the woods, I do it here. Uh, you'll see my system utilized as kind of the reference in this presentation a number of times today. I'm coming to you, I'm talking to you from the Toso Time Studio, but this is a separate structure. It's on my residential property here, but it's a se separate structure from my wife and I's home here. In the home, we have uh, an Apex system. Here in the studio, you can see that we have a Toso uh, multi-zone uh, 42,000 ultra heat system, which cools and heats. It's the sole source of heating here uh, for the Toso Time Studio. But getting back to the point uh, with the electric strip with the Apex, if you utilize it, you bring the power, you br bring your 208, 230 volt power source to the breakers of the electric strip, the eight, uh, the uh, the electric heater kit. The kit, the 8KW and the 10 has one breaker, as you see there. The 15 and the 20 has two. And again, I'll show you this in great detail as we move forward. Here's the uh, 15 and the 20 with the two all factory supplied and wired uh, breakers. So the Gen 2 Telso Apex indoor unit, guys, which were, we are already uh, up to the Gen 2, or it is forthcoming. I actually think you guys, Emco, has some already, which is wonderful. But you'll notice that the indoor unit will have the addition of an indoor coil temperature sensor to prevent fan operation if the coil is not up to temperature. Now, how we're accomplishing that right now with the Gen 1 is frankly through a delay uh, fan setting on the thermostat. Uh, virtually all the digital thermostats nowadays, even the lesser expensive ones, like you'll see the one that I use. The indoor unit guys has uh, some dip switches. L let me, here's, here's note number two for the day. Both the Apex indoor and outdoor unit have a series of dip switches which must be set by the installing contractor. Uh, they are set on some factory defaults, but there's probably some tweaking that the installer needs to do specific to that application. And we'll talk about that in great detail as we move forward today. Uh, but I just want to bring to your attention right now uh, that uh, there are a set of two dip switches, just like you see right here on the indoor unit. And uh, we'll go into great detail as to what they do and how to set them as we move forward. Here is the uh, control board of the indoor unit, guys. And uh, I have one here. And we'll refer to that a number of times throughout the day. The first thing you should notice, 
<laughs> is that it's upside down. And that's not a problem with the picture. I didn't uh, orient it incorrectly or anything like that. What you see, my friends, is what you get in the actual unit. The board, let me go back. The boards, both indoor and outdoor unit, are upside down. I don't know why. Not sure if there's a logical reason for it, uh, but nonetheless, they are up so down, uh, upside down. So just be aware of that. It's it's easily overcome in the field. We'll talk about that as we move forward. The uh, the indoor board as well as the outdoor board is over current protection uh, protected. You can see a uh, fuse there. And for those of us of an of a certain age, which is me, because I'm old. Uh, that very much looks like the fuse out of a 1972 Ford Pinto. <laughs> it looks like that. And frankly, it is. Uh, it is pretty much what was used as uh, fuses in the older automobiles. Um, the beauty of the 1972 Pinto was when the windshield wipers stopped working. You just went to the local uh, little uh, convenience store, got a tin of those little glass type replacement fuses, put a new one in, and magically the windshield wipers started working again. Um, yeah, so uh, the beauty of the indoor and outdoor boards of the Apex system is that they are overcurrent protected with a fuse. But guys, I want to stress this to you. This is important, especially for those of you in sales for this item. A fuse is not surge protection. Surge protection is surge protection. And guys, this is where I'm going to stop being the Toso trainer just for a minute. And I just want to talk to you friend to friend, business person to business person. You should be, first of all, you should be selling a surge protector. I got to believe you do. I, I, I don't know. You, someone can unmute and let me know if, if, if MCO uh, does stock one of these products. But you should be encouraging every one of your customers who purchase any Toso product, I don't care if it's mini split or Apex, to surge protect it. Um, an item which will net out to them for less than $100, probably substantially less than $100, can save them thousands of dollars in lost boards, lost equipment, and uh, lost compressors. If that system, if that circuit were to take a surge, whether it be God made in the form of lightning or man made in the form of something internal to the grid, these items are sacrificial. And I have some examples of them here. Here we have the uh, Intermatic AG3000. This is what I used for years, guys. And the reason why I used it for years, quite frankly, was because it was the only game in town. Luckily, it's a really great product and I still use it to this day. This is what I'm primarily using now, which is the uh, Rector Seal RSH50. I like it because it's small. You can see quite a bit smaller than the AG300. Uh, and then another product from my friends at Diversitech is, uh, I think they call this the Surge Trap, kind of similar to the AG3000 in physical size. My my point is this, guys. Um, again, you should be selling these products and you should be encouraging your installers and service techs to install them with all TOSO systems. It can save them a lot of heartache and it can save them a whole lot of cash. Okay, let's move on. Um, the drain pan of the indoor unit, there are two, one positioned for the traditional vertical application, but the indoor unit, guys, can be placed in a horizontal uh, position. The drain pan for the horizontal application, I'm pointing to it there in the picture, it is from the factory in the air inlet out left, return air right configuration. But you can reverse that uh, in the field, and I'll show you how to do that as we move forward. So that pan can be moved from this side to this side to uh, literally reverse the discharge out return air in configuration. Uh, nothing particularly unique about the condensate uh, connections, guys. Three quarter inch drain holes, no big whoop there. Nothing particularly uh, extraordinary, again, either for the vertical or horizontal application. The indoor unit, the Apex indoor unit does have a TXV. And guys, you don't have to match the Apex indoor unit with the Apex 
outdoor unit. That's the beauty. One of the many advantages of this product. Uh, you can match the Apex outdoor unit with any 14 sear or better R410A uh, fan coil. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about dual fuel applications, which I know is big up in Canada. Um, and we also now have just a, a, a coil option as well, where you don't have to buy the, 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 uh, the Apex fan coil unit. You can just buy a traditional A coil as well. The bottom line, no matter who makes it, no matter who you buy it from, no matter where, uh, what the manufacturer is, if you're going to use someone else's indoor unit, whether it be A coil or, or, or uh, a fan coil, must be 14 sear or better, uh, and it must have a TXV. And again, we'll talk more about that in, in some detail as we move forward. The blower fan motor of the Apex indoor unit, guys, uh, is a constant torque motor. Constant torque motors are high efficiency. They're brushless DC motors. If the ESP, the external static pressure, changes, a dirty filter, something more dramatic like a, I don't know, a, a, a duct collapsing, collapsing that, that's very dramatic. <laughs> but then the motor program will try to maintain the amount of torque for which it was programmed. Very, very unique in that way. I, I always find constant torque motors to be of a bit of a, of a double-edged sword. Yes, they try to overcome problems that may take place uh, with external static pressure within a system, but also they could kind of band-aid or disguise a problem that really needs to be addressed. They're really there for the dirty filter situation. As, as we know, no matter how many times we tell homeowners about filters and how they need to be replaced uh, in, in a certain amount of time, 30 days, 60 days, whatever it may be, they never do. And that's why this motor is, is trying to overcome. But at some point, it, it can overcome a completely clogged filter. So uh, it will need to be addressed. There's the A-coil, guys. Nothing particularly extraordinary about uh, about the fan coil in general, to be honest with you, uh, the Apex fan coil, but certainly nothing particularly extraordinary about the A-coil. Other than this, what note are we up to? I think we're up to note number three. Here's note number three of the day. Write this down. It's serious, baby. <laughs> the Apex A-coil comes charged, eh? not with nitrogen. It comes charged with R410A. Very, very unusual, very, very different. Uh, our installers are going to think that it is charged with nitrogen and let that charge go. And that's going to be a problem, <laughs> right? So please make sure that your installers understand that the Apex indoor and, of course, outdoor coils are charged. And again, I'll give you more details. I'll tell you exactly what that charge is. I'll tell you exactly what the pre-charge is as far as length of line set as we move forward. But guys, it's something that we always need to make our installers, our customers aware of uh, that the uh, the coil is charged with R410, not, not nitrogen. Here's uh, maybe feature number one of the day. Uh, something I really, really love about this product. We have service valves. There's a three eighths inch liquid. There's a three quarter inch gas. But if you look closely at those valves, guys, of the indoor unit, and remember, we're still on the indoor unit. You'll notice that there's service valves on each. That's a beautiful thing. Nobody does that. And I love that Toso does that with this product. You may not be able to appreciate it, but I can. I spent 23 years in a truck. My wife and I owned an HVAC service and install company out of New York and New Jersey. And uh, why is this is such a benefit to your customer? Think about it, guys. They no longer are limited to pressure testing, evacuation, and charging all through the outdoor unit. Think about a day like today, wherever you are in Canada. One of you guys was telling me it was a little muggy, a little cold, a little slushy up there. How about being able to do everything I just mentioned, leak test, evacuation, and charging all at the indoor unit, all at the relative comfort of the basement of the home instead of being outside in the element? Your customers are going to love this. I love this. So 
Uh, again, a, a great benefit to have service valves, not only at the outdoor unit, they're there too, right? Like to, in any traditional system, but to have them at the indoor unit as well, a great advantage. And we'll talk more about that uh, when I get into evacuation and leak testing and charging. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But let me go back just for a second. One more point I wanna make before I move off of that slide. Remember that the coil being charged, right? Think about all you're evacuating and leak testing. All you are evacuating and leak testing is the line set, right, baby? I mean, think about it. Both coils, both ends of those line sets are closed. You have a charged coil on either end. So the only thing you are leak testing and evacuating and possibly charging if you had to add more refrigerant is the line set itself. That really speeds up what can normally be a relatively slow operation, especially in evacuation. And again, I'll, I'll talk more about that as we move forward. Guys, your, your filters, I'm gonna speak specifically to the uh, three and four ton. I, I think you guys know this, but I'll, I'll, I'll just clarify. Uh, the indoor unit Apex, two physical products, two physical models that represent four capacities. The smaller unit, two and three ton, one product, one, one model. The larger two, the second product, three and uh, uh, four and five, I should say. So two and three, one product, four and five, another product. Four capacities over two units. The larger one, and this is why this one's always in my consciousness, is what we have in the house here. And uh, it takes a 20 by 23 filter. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. To gain access to the filter, you simply on these, undo these two little uh, twisty knobs at the bottom of the, uh, the fan coil unit, and this cover is removable, and that will gain you access to the factory-supplied permanent filter. Now, I think most of you guys will agree with me that you and your customers don't like factory-supplied uh, permanent washable filters. I don't either. Uh, I took this thing out and literally threw it away with the packaging. But let me throw this at you. For the larger of the two units, again, the, the four and the five ton, that is a 20 by 23 by one filter. Um, you, well, you guys are already on board with the Apex. So um, I, I know you, I know Emco has been on board with Apex for at least a, a year. So you probably already conquered this issue of finding a source for a 20 by 23 by one filter. I will tell you locally here, um, you, you, you go to the local supply houses, even, even the, the, the big box uh, uh, hardware stores, nobody has a 20 by 23. Everybody has a 20 by 22, but not a 20 by 23. So I had to order that uh, via an online source. When I did this class for your... Uh, your brothers up in Quebec, the, the deluxe air uh, locations, they told me that a lot of their customers uh, actually make their own filter, problem solved. So uh, not an issue if they're making it their own. But again, just so that you know, a little bit of an odd uh, dimension for the larger of the two uh, indoor units, a 20 by 23. All right, we are ready for another quiz. This is for my friends on Prince Edward Island. Now everybody can participate. Everybody can go ahead and unmute for a minute. You don't have to be from Prince Edward Island, but I'm trying to represent uh, each of the provinces that you guys represent. So here's your Prince Edward Island quiz. What member, present member of the New York Islanders is from Prince Edward Island? Is it Mr. Corey Schneider? Is it Matthew Barzal? Is it Noah Dobson? Or is it Bodie Wild? Who is it? Come on, give it up. It's me. Noah Dobson. Ah, very good. It is Noah. And Noah doesn't look old enough to drive, nevertheless, be in the, in the in NHL. And he scored his first goal there. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I believe Noah was drafted in 2018. I don't know if you're catching. I, I actually have a memento on the unit there, on the Tulsa Outdoor unit. I, I hope you can see that. Uh, that, uh, now you can, <laughs> now you can see that, uh, the memento there from the New York Islanders, I bought that at the very first hockey game I ever went to 
I believe the year was 1974. That's when the Islanders were the Islanders in Nassau Coliseum. Um, and I still, I can't believe I still have it. So, uh, yeah. All righty, guys. Very good. No adoption. Okay, guys. Uh, so that covers the anatomy of the indoor unit. Let's take a look now at the outdoor unit and get our scalpel out and start dissecting it. We're going to start with the main control board. And, and, and once again, I have an example of the main control board. We'll refer to that a number of times as we move forward today. Uh, once again, overcurrent protected with a fuse. Now listen up. I'm not going to give you the same rant that I already gave you about surge protection, but I will make this note. With a split system like the Apex is, you're bringing a 208, 230 volt circuit to the indoor unit, right? And you're also bringing a separate and unique 208, 230 volt circuit to the outdoor unit, as you see here. So that really requires people two surge protectors, one on the outdoor unit and one on the indoor unit. So something that you want to stress to your customers as well. Is it necessary? No. I just highly, very strongly as I possibly can recommend it. So guys, there is a, a little, little LED screen uh, on the main board of the outdoor unit. And this is where information will be given to the uh, service tech and to the installer. Um, I'm going to just take a moment to tell you how impressed, even after all these years, you know, I've, I've been with Toso in one form or, the, or another, sometimes by a different brand name, but same product for... I don't know, something crazy like 30 years, you know, for 23 years, my wife and I were their uh, installers in New York and New Jersey. And the last seven or eight years, uh, I've been their uh, trainer, uh, both in the United States and, and, and now in Canada. And even after all these years, guys, I am still blown away. I am still fascinated by the, by the onboard diagnostic capabilities of these systems. To me, it's one of probably a half a dozen areas where Toso really, really shines. I have yet to find another product within HVAC or beyond HVAC that matches or betters uh, the, the capabilities, the onboard diagnostic capabilities of these systems. And, and the, here's an example of that. There's little, literally a little LED screen on the uh, outdoor unit board. It is right there. And it will give you all kinds of information that we'll talk about as we move forward. The only downside to it, I told you I'm always going to be honest and give it to you straight. The only downside to that LED screen is that it is on the board and the board is internal to the outdoor unit. I really wish that Toso can create a window where you don't have to replace or I should say remove the front cover of the outdoor unit in order to visually see what that uh, LED screen is telling you. I, I'm hoping that's an improvement that can be made uh, as we move forward. But for the moment, you do have to remove the front cover in order to uh, to see it. Guys, let's go through uh, what that control board controls, if you will, uh, on the uh, Apex outdoor unit. We have an electric heating belt for the chassis for the base of the outdoor unit. You know, it's interesting when, when I mention this to uh, our distributors or, or, or installers in the 11th Providence of, of Florida, right? Those guys and gals just kind of give me a blank stare when I show them that the, the base panel, the base of, of the outdoor unit has a heating element. They don't get it. And, and frankly, they don't need to get it, right? They're, they're, it serves no purpose in the southern states of the United States. But in your neck of the woods, that's life or death, baby, right? And you know it, right? This product couldn't, could not exist without that heating element in the base pan. So that's why it's there. There's also a heating element for the compressor itself. You can see that heating element there. I've circled it for you at the base of the unit. It's, it's literally strapped around the unit. Guys, uh, here's uh, note number four or five, whatever we're up to. That comp compressor needs to be preheated before the system operates for the first time. Now, what does that mean? It's pretty serious stuff. 
Uh, Toso wants that unit to be energized, not turned on. Not we, we don't want an active call for cooling or heating. We just want the outdoor unit to be powered, listen to me now, for a minimum of eight hours before the system is operated for the first time. Now, I know you're all sitting there. I can't see you, but I, every, I know every one of you just sat back and said, what the heck is that? We, who's going who's gonna to wait eight hours to commission the system? Well, we'll talk about it. We, we can lessen that, that time. It, it all depends upon the outdoor air temperature. It also depends upon if the unit has been stored uh, in a heated uh, warehouse or somewhat climate controlled warehouse like an MCO, which, which, which is all good news. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the key to this is to encourage our installers. The first thing they should do at a job site is to set the outdoor unit and bring power to it and then do everything else. But um, <clears throat> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this kind of wacky uh, eight hour preheat requirement and how we can kind of cut that down quite a bit and, and, and make that a little bit more reasonable. So we'll talk about that as we move forward. Four-way valve is uh, controlled through the main board of the outdoor unit. The four-way valve, nothing particularly extraordinary here, guys. Uh, it just allows the customer with the press of a button uh, to go from heating to cooling. And all of that is done via the reversing valve. We have an electromatic valve interface. That, <laughs> that sounds fancy, right? Sounds important. Uh, and it is important. And, and, and this is what it looks like. Guys, what's important for you to understand and, and what's even more so important for your customers to understand is that this system, the Apex system, is very much two systems in one. And I know it's a split system, right? Duh. So it's kind of obvious. But, but what I mean by that is internal to the outdoor unit, it's very much two separate systems. As you'll see in just a moment, the outdoor unit of the Apex has two EEVs, electronic expansion valve. And what you already saw of the indoor unit is that the indoor unit has a TXV. Well, how the heck does that work? Why, why the heck do we need three expansion valves, two of them electronic and one thermally actuated? Well, this is why. Again, because it's very much two separate systems. When the system is in the heating mode, the two EEVs of the outdoor unit are, 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 are doing the heavy lifting, so to speak. The TXV in the heating mode is doing nothing, absolutely nothing. Just the opposite in the cooling mode. In the cooling mode, the TXV of the indoor units doing the heavy lifting and the EEVs of the outdoor unit, nothing at all. And, and how that happens, my friends, the, the easiest way I can describe it is through this electromatic valve. It's a bypass, ladies and gentlemen, for lack of a better description. You know, electro, uh, electromagnetic valve is just a fancy way of Tosa to say that that is a bypass valve. When it's energized, we're allowing the EEVs of the indoor unit to, uh, to do their work. When it's not, the TXV of the indoor unit is doing its work. And mentioning the EEVs, the electronic expansion valves, uh, here they are of the Apex outdoor unit. Here's number one. And just about right next to it is number two. And again, they're doing the work in the heating mode, the TXV of the indoor during the cooling mode. We have the connection to the drive con connection interface. This is the drive board, people. We'll come back to it. This is located at the top of the Apex outdoor unit. Um, I I I'm going to come back to this. I just want to let you know that we are connected to the main board, uh, but I'll give you more detail on this in just a little while. So we have a high pressure switch, a high pressure sensor, if you will. Actually, we have two, as you'll see in a moment. Here's the first of the two. And of course, well, maybe not of course, but we do have a low pressure sensor as well in the outdoor unit. And here is that second high pressure sensor. Why two high pressure sensors? Well, for the same reason, that we have that electromagnetic interface valve, that bypass valve, because 
during the heating mode and during the cooling mode, there are sections of the outdoor unit which aren't doing anything, baby, that are completely segregated from the task at hand, so to speak. So that's why there are two high pressure switches so that each of them are strategically placed that in the matter, whether we're in the heating or the cooling mode, there is an active high pressure switch in the right place, so to speak. Make sense? I hope so. <laughs> and then we have our sensors, our thermistors, I should say. There's a total of four uh, thermistors, a thermistor people being nothing more than an electronic temperature sensor. You know, most, um, not most, virtually all um, thermostats nowadays are, are working on an electronic thermistor than opposed to an old mercury bulb uh, thermostat like a Honeywell T87F. And that's what these are. The, these are temperature sensing uh, thermistors. There's four of them. We have the outdoor temperature sensor. Uh, we have the outdoor tube, which is essentially is the heat exchanger temperature sensor. And we have a discharge temperature sensor. And that is the discharge uh, of the refrigerant coming off the top of the uh, compressor. And I'll show you, show you each of them. Here is the uh, heat exchanger temperature sensor, if you will, the, uh, uh, the coil temperature sensor at the, uh, the bottom of the coil of the outdoor unit. Here is your outdoor uh, ambient temperature sensor just kind of hangs from the outdoor unit. And lastly, this is your discharge temperature sensor. Again, discharge being the discharge of the compressor. You can see that it is attached literally to the discharge tube coming off the top of the compressor. And the fourth and last of the thermistors of the outdoor unit is the low temperature sensing thermistor. It's separate from the other three, or at least it, its um, connection to the board is separate from the other three. And there you can see it there at one of the U-bends of the coil of the outdoor unit. Okay, um, the thermostat interface. I actually don't like that description. This is really, I, I think, better described as the communication interface because we're not hooking up our thermostat to the outdoor unit. You know that. We're hooking it up to the indoor unit. But there is communication, 24-volt communication, from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit and vice versa. And that's what this is. This is our communication circuit, YB, W1, R, C, and G, the same nomenclature that we saw for our thermostat connections of the indoor unit. But this is our communication between the outdoor and the indoor unit. Guys, uh, lastly on the indoor board is our source of power for the fan or fans of the outdoor unit. Uh, again, the smaller, the 24, the 36, there would just be one. As you can see here, this is the, the, uh, the 36, 40, no, the 48, 60. Uh, and this is what I have here at the house in Pennsylvania. You can see that uh, there are actually two stacked fans. And just so that you know, uh, when they operate, they operate simultaneously. A question I get quite often when I have a group of techs in front of me or installers, I'm asked, is there ever a situation, a condition where only one of the two fans operates? And I can just tell you from personal experience, from witnessing it, no. It does not. The two fans work in unison, as you see here. And that's actually uh, the unit just outside the house here. Okay, and lastly on the main control board is the 310V DC power supply interface. And that brings us to the filtering board. The filtering board, well, actually, it's a pretty good description of what it is. It's a, it, it, it's a power filter. It makes sure that the power that you your customers are supplying to the uh, system is as clean uh, as possible. So that's what that, that filtering board is doing. It's taking the 208, 230 volt power source and uh, just making sure that it, that power is as clean as possible. Guys, uh, the outdoor unit, obviously there's a coil there, right? <laughs> Duh. Um, there is an acrylic resin coating on that coil to prevent corrosion. It kind of gives the coil a bit of a, 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 a gold tint to it. You can see at the top of the picture there, the top of the coil, it's, it's more pronounced. It, 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 the gold tint is, is really more pronounced depending upon the lighting. Um, 
and but I think you get a good sense of it at, at the top of the coil there. Now look, the the next question or the obvious question whenever I talk about corrosion prevention is how much corrosion prevention, you know? We we had a in, in believe it or not in New Orleans we have had a customer that put Toso VRF systems on tugboats. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about a corrosive situation, not only salt air, but salt water, right? Hey, look, there, there's no protective corrosion that's going to keep a coil on a tugboat from rotting. It becomes a cost of doing business, and it was for them. And it was a great annuity policy for us, right? We were selling them uh, new outdoor units for those systems really on a, on, on a 24 to 36-month uh, basis, which was a beautiful – and they knew it. They weren't upset by that. They knew it was a cost of doing business. Um, you guys will, you know, have to inform me. Uh, Prince Edward Island, you know, perfect example. You're an island. <laughs> right? You know, I do not know how severe corrosion can be. I can imagine. And I imagine it's 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 something that we we have to deal with. So important for you guys to know that the coil uh, does have that acrylic resin to uh, do our best to uh, prevent any corrosion and, and keep the product working for many, many years to come, even in environments like Pr Prince Edward Island. Okay, let's go back to that drive board, guys. Um, I just want to tell you what that board does. You know, we talked about the indoor board. We talked about uh, the main board of, uh, of the outdoor unit. We talked about the uh, filter board. Uh, and here's the dry board. I just kind of briefly, I showed it to you and then moved on. I just want to give you two details to the uh, to the, the the dry board. It is the power source. I, I understand why they call it the dry board because it is what drives the inverter compressor. Uh, and as you'll learn, if you don't already know, and I kind of think you know, that an inverter compressor is a modulating compressor. Well, this is where it happens, baby. This is where that modulation takes place. Uh, it happens at the drive board. You see your U, your V, and W power source. That is your three conductor power source from the drive board, which powers our inverter compressor. So obviously a very important function. Uh, another function it can perform is that this could be the discharge point for the, uh, um, oh my gosh. <laughs> transformers, not the transformers. What, what I, I I'm, I'm having, um, uh, see a lot of people call this a, uh, senior moment. My friends, I call this a resin drip. <laughs> Enough said. Um, hey, clean and sober, it'll be 31 years, so don't get any ideas. But yes, it's a resin drip from the old days. Um, what, what, what is it discharging? Somebody unmute and help me. I, I, I'm, I'm lost here. The, the simplest thing, I can't think of the name. But anyway, this is where we can discharge the power <laughs> so our customers don't hurt themselves when they immediately put their hands into the outdoor unit. Oh my gosh, it'll come back to me. It's one of those things I'll wake up in the middle of the night screaming the word. <laughs> you guys probably already know the word. So anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, guys, um, we're moving along here. I promise we'll, we'll take a break fairly soon. Um, but before we do that, I, I want to talk about the inverter compressor. Uh, as impressed as I am with the onboard diagnostics of these systems, I am equally impressed with the inverter compressor. Guys, a, a little shameless self-promotion, if you allow me. Uh, I write a column called the Duck Free Zone. Up in Canada, I'm still looking for some uh, publications to carry it. Right now, there are two. The HPAC magazine, their online edition carries it. Uh, which is wonderful. Uh, hopefully I'll get in their printed version at some point. Also, my good friend, Gary McCready, the HVAC know-it-all, uh, he also uh, carries it on his website, which I appreciate very, very much. I just had a conversation yesterday with a mag magazine out of BC, um, the HVAC X Changer, it's called, and uh, I'm hoping 
that possibly they'll pick it up uh, in, in the future. But anyway, so I write this column. And about two years ago, I dedicated the column to the inverter compressor. And I made this statement two years ago, and I'm going to make it again. Uh, I believe the inverter compressor is the most significant invention in HVAC in my lifetime, not just my career, but in my lifetime. I hate cliches, but I can't help myself. You want to talk about game changing. The inverter compressor has been game changing. Uh, it, it's what allows us to zone the Toso multi-zone systems. It, it, it's what allows this product, the Apex product, to be so unique, to have a modulating compressor that can be a universal replacement for every unitary outdoor unit. I mean, how cool is that? So I want to, frankly, I want you to feel the same way I feel about the inverter compressor. And to get you there, I'm going to talk about the advantages of the inverter compressor, the energy efficiency. Look, the efficiency of what we're talking about here, it's good, right? 20 sear ain't nothing to sneeze at. But you look at the, uh, the sear rating of the Lomo Plus mini split, <laughs> my friends, 38 sear? Are you kidding me? 38 sear? I never thought I'd say that in my lifetime, nevertheless my career, all because all because of the inverter compressor. Uh, the inverter compressor is also what makes these systems so easy to install, and it is what gives these systems versatility, not only in the Apex product, but also in our mini splits as well. So guys, um, I think I'm confident in saying I've never met any of you before today. Uh, I met Bruce. I don't know if Bruce is on board uh, yet. I didn't, I didn't see him sign in, but uh, – if he is, he would be the exception. I, I don't think I've met any anyone else. But I am absolutely confident every one of you used an inverter last night. And I am equally confident you guys are going to use that same inverter again tonight. You know, the most common inverter in our day-to-day -day lives is our cell phone charger, right? You know, right now, this is a DC appliance. But every night, we hook up an alternating current to it. We, we don't think twice about it, right? This laptop that I'm using as a monitor right now, uh, once this COVID thing finally gets resolved, uh, I want to come see you. I hope you invite me. And when I'm on a plane heading up to see you, this uh, laptop becomes a DC appliance. But right now, I'm not only uh, running it with an alternating current, I'm charging it with an alternating current. My point being, guys, is inverters have been in our lives. We're just not always aware of them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there are two very, very common examples that have been around for a long, long time. The Apex inverters are all 208, 230 volts. We do have some exception to that in the mini split world uh, with uh, some 115 volt product, which I love that Toso still makes that available. But in the Apex, everything 208, 230 volt. So guys, an inverter controls the operating speed of a DC motor by controlling the frequency and the voltage of the power supplied to that motor. Compared to the common on-off control compressor, the inverter control compressor is able to run at the proper revolutions to pro provide the best efficiency and reduce losses. Hey, look, I, I, I forget how many of you guys are, 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 are tuned in here today. I think there was a little over 10 uh, maybe as many as 15. Again, thank you for that. Appreciate you spending your valuable time with me today. Um, but here's the deal. <laughs> if, if you're going to retain anything from this webinar today, let it be the next two sentences. I'm serious, guys, because the next two sentences are all you need to retain because, frankly, it's all you need to explain. When you guys are performing a sales function and talking about the advantages of the inverter compressor. Here it is, listen up. When the maximum capacity is not required, the compressor revolutions are decreased. People, please. <laughs> There's nothing I say today, at least about the inverter compressor, that should make your brain hurt. Don't overthink this. It truly is that simple. When the maximum capacity is not required, we slow it down, baby. Yeah, this means the input power decreases as well, 
which results in increased system efficiency. I think the best analogy to use when we're talking to a novice, a potential customer, a civilian, <laughs> as I call them, about the advantages of the inverter compressor, use the automotive analogy because the automotive analogy works. I did it with all my customers back in New York and New Jersey for 23 years. And, and the one I always use as an example was my favorite customer, my first customer and my last customer, Mrs. Gillicuddy. I talk a lot about Mrs. Gillicuddy and a lot of you think that she's a made up character that I've made up and she's not. She's a real live person still with us to the day, to this day. But she was my first customer and she literally was my last customer. And today, Mrs. Gillicuddy is well into her 80s. Uh, she's all by herself. Mr. Gillicuddy passed some time ago. She is not in good health, but her mind sharp as attack, baby. I mean, really sharp as attack. She's a pistol. And I could tell you guys, I know for a fact Mrs. Gillicuddy could care less about inverter compressors. She could even care less about SEER ratings. But what she understands is the automobile. She's got a 1972 Chevy Malibu sitting out in the, in the, in the parking lot, right? Unfortunately, it's a four-door. Mm. If it was a two-door, it'd be a Chevelle, and we'd be at Meekum or Barrett-Jackson auctions, right? But yeah, it's a four-door. But my point is this. Old lady Gillicuddy knows when she puts the pedal to the metal that the Malibu takes off. She also knows when she lets her foot off the gas that the Malibu slows down. And she also knows when she puts the Malibu into cruise control that the speed maintains. And I tell you this, my friends, because that is exactly how GRI operates an inverter compressor. When the load is great, we can spin it up to 3,600 RPM like every other compressor in the world. But the key is, the difference is, the deal maker is, when the load is less than great, we can take our foot off the gas. And when we take our foot off the gas, we use less gas. Well, we use less voltage. You know what I'm talking about. And when the system finds the sweet spot, and what I'm calling the sweet spot in this context is her set point temperature whether that be 68, 70, 72 degrees, once the system finds and establishes that sweet spot, well then baby, it is cruise control. Now we're just maintaining the revolutions of the compressor to maintain that set point temperature. Guys, does that make sense? I, I hope it does. I think it's a beautiful way, not only for our customers to get their head around the concept of an inverter modulating compressor, but also for us, right? I think we all have a good understanding of the automobile. It, it's, it's, it's a great analogy to make. Okay. Uh, it's an outdoor unit with a single variable speed DC compressor. Don't get hung up on that guys. Um, if you ever want more detail on, on the DC voltage of an inverter compressor, we could spend some time on that. We can spend some time on that when I take questions, if that's what you want to do, but don't get hung up on it. Yes. Yes. It, it, all inverter systems. I don't care who makes them. All inverter systems, if it has the word inverter in its description, it does this. It takes the AC current that we bring to it, and it turns it into a DC current. And look, can it be argued that it's really a simulated DC current? Sure, I don't care. That You know, <laughs> fine. That's semantics, baby. It doesn't matter, and it's nothing we need to get into here today. But all inverter compressors, I don't care who makes them. They all run on a DC charge. Do you want to know why? It's very simple, actually. We could have done it with an alternating current, but it would, apply, it would have required something like a uh, frequency drive. And for those of you who are familiar with a frequency drive and what it does, very expensive and another piece of equipment. So that's why the entire industry, not just TOSO, but the entire inverter industry, all utilize this simulated uh, DC voltage compressor because you can modulate it without a frequency drive. The inverter reacts to indoor and outdoor temperature fluctuations by adjusting the compressor speed to meet cooling and heating loads, optimizing energy usage. My favorite sentence in the whole presentation, because it brings me back to my youth. It brings me back to my youth with my pops. And uh, I'm just going to allow you to, guys, just humor me just for a second here. And let me tell you a little bit about Pops, and I promise you it'll make all sense in the context of what we're talking about here. 
My father, after returning from the Marines, World War II, Guadalcanal, 1945. Oh, the battle was 1942, but he comes back in 1945. Um, he finishes his education. He was 15 years old, 15 years old in the Battle of Guadalcanal. Um, that's a story for another day if you want to hear it. But um, he comes back honorably discharged after uh, 1945, after victory in Europe and victory in the Pacific. And he immediately goes into the boiler manufacturing uh, business. And by the time the 1970s came around, I got old enough to help pops. I'm old, yes. <laughs> Do the math. Um, and why I bring this up is how pops, well, pops had his 15 minutes of fame uh, in 1979. Mm -hmm. Pops was the first company, Hydrotherm Boilers was our name. We have a Canadian connection. To this day, even, Pops had a manufacturing plant in Mississauga, Ontario, still there to, to this day. Pops sold the company as he retired. Well, he actually stayed with the company for a few years, but uh, he sold the company in 1990, probably to people you do business with. Uh, Meztech out of uh, uh, Springfield, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, you may buy their RBI products. Wouldn't be surprised. Uh, they don't use the Hydrotherm name anymore. But look, I'm going off on a tangent. Let, let me reel myself back in. Um, Pops was the first company to introduce a modulating condensing boiler in 1979. A boiler, my friends, that in 1979 was 97% efficient. It was off the charts. Off the charts. It was literally his 15 minutes of fame. And how Pops modulated the output of the boiler was by taking the indoor temperature, which everybody did and everybody still does, and balancing it with the outdoor temperature. Come on, guys. You guys are wetheads when you're not talking about mini splits and apex systems. I know you sell boilers up there. You got to, right? In the hydronic world to this day, that's called indoor outdoor reset, right? You know what I'm talking about. I love that I'm talking to wetheads because you can appreciate this and you can make the connection. Absolutely. And I tell you this <laughs> because what is that? 45 years later or something like that? That is exactly how Toso controls an inverter compressor. An inverter compressor, my friends, is a modulating compressor. You know, when I tell you that, and I'll show you this very dramatically, we, we have four capacities, right? We have a 24, a 36, a 48, and a 60, right? But when I give you those four numbers, I'm really not giving you the whole story because each one of those systems has the ability to have a range, a very generous, a very dramatic range of capacity. And I will show you exactly what that range is for each one of the Apex systems. And again, how my pops modulated a boiler 45 years ago is exactly how Toso does it today, by taking the indoor temperature and balancing it with the outdoor temperature. Now, having said that, it's a little bit more complicated in the Apex world because there's less communication between the indoor and outdoor unit than there is on a Toso mini split system, right? There's less modulation going on, but modulation nonetheless. And it is the inverted compressor that, again, uh, provides these, these crazy efficiencies. In, in the Apex world, 20 sear. Again, nothing to sneeze at, in my opinion. Okay, so this is how the Apex uh, controls the modulation of the compressor. The Apex outdoor unit has sensors, thermistors. I, I've showed you them, right? Uh, on the suction and the discharge line, your gas and liquid. There's also a pressure transducer on the suction line. The system can sense the load at the outdoor unit by calculating superheat and subcooling in the system during operation as a result of these sensors, my friends. Right? It uses this measurement along with ambient temperature and runtime to determine the compressor speed, to determine the compressor RPM. Isn't that beautiful? Again, not as perfect, I will say, as the mini split product uh, because there is a direct communication between the indoor and outdoor unit in the mini split product. The 
Apex, we wanted to, I should say we, <laughs> I wish it was me. Uh, Tosa wanted to design the outdoor unit to be um, a universal replacement. Don't need to connect it with our indoor unit. So that's why there's less communication potential between the indoor and outdoor unit. So our modulation, our process of modulation, what determines modulation is a little bit more, I'll use the word primitive. That's probably not a good word. Uh, okay, here's better. A little bit, a little bit less sophisticated than what we see in our mini split product, but effective nonetheless. That's the bottom line. And here it is, right? The proof's in the pudding, right? The proof's in the numbers. Everybody says numbers don't lie. Well, here's your numbers, baby, right? That 24 volt or 24 volt, that 24,000 BTU system, look at this now, can give you as little as 8,000 BTUs, but as much as 30,000. My friends, that's one system, one system with that complete range of capacity from 8,000 to 30,000. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. The 60,000, the five ton system can give you as little as 25,000 BTUs, but as much as 60, one system, <laughs> one system with that complete range of modulation, with that complete range of capacity. I don't care how you want to word it. I don't care how you want to describe it, but th that baby is what makes inverter compressors so special, right? That there's many, there's many benefits, but to me, that's it. Right? That's what it's all about. You have a system now that is not locked in to 24, 36, 48, or 60. You have a very generous range of operation, a very generous range of capacity for each one of those systems. It's a beautiful thing, my friends. Okay, something that Toso always wants me to point out to you, and, and in turn, I want you to point out to your customers. Toso is proud that they not only design their own compressors, but they produce their own compressors. My friends, you open up the outdoor unit of virtually any mini split. And I know I'm going off subject here a little bit. We're talking apex, but you open up the outdoor unit of virtually any competitive inverter mini split. And you're going to find a Hitachi compressor. They, they own that market, my brothers and sisters, they own it, right? but not in the GRI world. GRI is very, very proud that they design and manufacture their own compressors. And this is the perfect example of why, that why they should be so proud. The new two-stage enhanced vapor injection compressor. That's the compressor that you're seeing in the Apex system. That's the compressor you're seeing in all of the ultra heat product, which I think shines up in your markets in, in Canada, right? Where you guys have extreme climates. We have the extreme product for you, baby, right? Heat down to negative 30 Fahrenheit, come on. <laughs> I mean, my father would have, it, it would have said impossible, right? I would have said impossible just a decade ago. And we're talking about a system that can give you rated capacity, mind you, down to negative 30 Fahrenheit. How do they do it? With this two-stage enhanced vapor injection compressor. Now guys, Remember where I started? I told you I was always going to give it to you straight. Well, this is going to be no different. Calling your compressor vapor injection, listen to me now, is a little bit like calling your beer fire brewed. Right? <laughs> of course your beer is fire brewed. That's what brewing is. <laughs> right? But the Stroh's Brewing Company, some years back, she said, my gosh. I don't even think I was old enough to drink when they started that ad campaign. Some brilliant marketing guy in Stroh's Brewing said, hey, stop the presses. Let's call it fire brood. <laughs> yeah, brilliant fire brood. That's what we'll call it. Well, all beer is fire brood. All compressors are vapor injection. Come on, people. You know that. We don't compress liquid, right? <laughs> that would be bad. Can't compress liquid, period. So every compressor is vapor injection. But what's different? <laughs> What's different is the two stage. Look at the suction inlets, plural. Yeah, you heard me. Suction inlets on that compressor, two, baby. I, I hope you all read. I think I sent it to you. 
If I didn't, again, you can read it on my LinkedIn profile. You could read it on uh, uh, HBAC uh, magazine, and you could read it at the uh, HBAC Know It All. My my last article spoke exactly to the two stage compressor. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into a super amount of detail here, but the fact that we have two suction port uh, ports at two different pressures. You guys remember from sixth grade science class, old lady Gillicuddy, she taught us that when matter changes state, right? Um, liquid to gas, uh, gas to solid, uh, liquid to solid, blah, blah, blah. She told us that liquid could sta change state. We know that. But what she didn't tell us was that when matter changes state, it also produces energy. And what she also didn't tell us is that when a gas changes presser, pressure, we also create energy. And that's what we're talking about here. And energy in this con conversation, in this context, is heat, baby. So that's why we can get these crazy uh, low temperature heat numbers out of the two-stage enhanced vapor injection. I'll move on. Another very, very important factor to the GRI two-stage vapor enhanced compressor is something very, very new, something very, very innovative that, that, that TOSO is utilizing here, and that is the turbo encabulator. Now, guys, I'm going to be honest with you. Even this is over my head. Right, I do a I, I do a very bad job describing the turbo and tabulator, so I hired this guy to do it for you. For a number of years now, work has been proceeding in order to bring perfection to the crudely conceived idea of a transmission that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal grammeters. Such an instrument is the turbo encabulator. Now, basically, the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it is produced by the modial interaction of magneto-reluctance and capacitive directance. The original machine had a base plate of prefamulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fam. The latter consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding was of the normal lotus o delta type placed in panendermic semi-boloid slots of the stator every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremi pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the Grammys. The turbo encabulator has now reached a high level of development and it's being successfully used in the operation of nofertrunions. Moreover, whenever a fluorescent score motion is required, it may also be employed in conjunction with a drawn reciprocation dingle arm to reduce sinusoidal repleneration. It's not cheap, but I'm sure the government will buy it. <laughs> hey, hey, let's get to our friends Thanks. in New Brunswick. If I could get everybody to mute again, thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, 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 no, unmute, unmute, everybody unmute. So where does New Brunswick export 92% of its total foreign trade? That's an interesting question. Where does New Brunswick export 92% of its total foreign trade? Does it go to China? Does it go to the United States? Does it go to Mexico? Or does it go to Russia? United States. United States, absolutely. And do you know what 67% of that 92% consist of? Anybody? What product? Oil. Refi Wood. Refi yeah, ref refined petroleum. So tell me, guys, is is Prince, uh, rather New Brunswick, just full of refineries? I would have to think so, right? We've got like yes. a couple big ones. Yeah, six, 67 percent of that 92 percent is actually a refined petroleum. So that's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> we need that here in the United States. Thank you very much. OK, guys, uh, I, I know you're ready for a break, but please bear with me. I promise we're getting close.
and you'll have a nice good 15 minute break when we get there. But just a couple things before we get there. I want to go through the basic operation and the function of the Apex and we'll start with it in the cooling mode. Now these charts are all in our service manuals. A little heads up, we'll talk about it at the very end, uh, but a little heads up, if, if, if a customer is asking you for manuals, or all of our manuals are at tosoamerica.com, I'll show you how to get them uh, before we leave today. But the best manual for this product is the service manual. Uh, it's really all encompassing. It's it's both install. It's called the service manual, but it's both installation and service. Um, by far, the most information in, at one location is in the service manual. But here, we see the system is powered on. We get an active call for cooling. First thing that happens is that the indoor fan begins to run. Then the compressor and the outdoor fan begins to run. Guys, if the system has been running at a low frequency, a low RPM. Now you guys know what I'm talking about when I say low frequency, low RPM. If it's been running at a low frequency for a long time, the system's going to enable the oil return control to bring the oil back to the compressor. This provides, uh, this process takes all of about uh, five minutes. I just realized that if you didn't hear the audio on that last video, you didn't hear it on the, um, on the Edmund Fitzgerald, and that that stinks. <laughs> I got to figure out how to make the audio play. Huh, that, that's going to drive me crazy now. But anyway, uh, okay. So if, if again, if it's been running at low frequency, it's going to go into this oil return process. Uh, that operation will take place. The oil will return after about five minutes, and now we have met the set point temperature and the system starts to power down. The compressor and the outdoor fan are going to stop. And then the compressor will stop for a minimum of three minutes before we start the compressor again for the next active call for cooling. I want to stop there just for a minute. So the compressor is always going to have this on and six minute off cycle. I'll, I'll talk about why this, well, the six minute off cycle is to prevent short cycling. The compressor will always be off for three minutes. That is, it's gonna be off for three minutes, and then on the next call for cooling in this, in this uh, example, it's going to take three minutes for that compressor to start again for a total of a six minute delay. This is good for the inverter compressor. So that's why you have that three minute off and then three minute delay again for it to start. Why don't you show you quickly the actual uh, component diagram in the cooling mode and point out to you once again, there is your TXV of the indoor unit. And just a reminder, the TXV is what's being utilized. That is our um, metering device being utilized in the cooling mode. Let's go to the heating mode. Again, we power on, we have an active call for heat, indoor fan operates, compressor and the outdoor fan begin to run. Again, if there is a need for the oil return feature that will take place, then we start to, uh, we, we meet our temperature setting, we meet our set point temperature setting, the compressor and the outdoor fan are de-energized. And once again, there is our three minutes off and three minutes again delayed to start for a minimum of six minutes off. Uh, something I just want to point out in the heating mode is uh, if it were to go into defrost, and the defrost will start, guys, when the temperature sense by the outdoor temperature sensor reaches a preset value. Uh, so if it were to go into uh, defrost, uh, it kind of just goes through that process. And, and, and you actually, when I say you, your customer actually has some control over the defrost cycle. They can force it into defrost. I'll show you how to do that. But also they can elongate the defrost cycle. Something unique about the Apex outdoor unit is one of the dip switches allows you to go from the standard uh, defrost cycle to what they call a strong cycle, which just simply means it elongates the defrost cycle if uh, additional defrosting is, is required. And again, I'll get to that um, hopefully after break. <laughs> but once again, here's the component diagram and the flow chart 
in the heating mode. And as I mentioned to you earlier, where we started today, the two EEVs of the indoor unit being utilized only when the system is in the heating mode. So control modes, uh, mode, short cycling. Uh, I've, I've, I've spoken about this in, in some detail already. A compressor off for three minutes, compressor delayed for three minutes. So you're always going to have this six minute cycle off. Um, again, this is necessary for the inverter compressor uh, to run and to run uh, without short cycling and to last a very, very long time. The EEV uh, in the heating mode, I can actually operate this EEV. You can watch the pin metering the refrigerant going through the valve and the two EEVs of the outdoor unit uh, being used only in the heating mode. The outdoor fan, whether it be one or two, is, um, is obviously controlled with uh, 10 levels of speed for the outdoor fan motor. Cooling and heating, nothing extraordinary uh, here, guys. Again, all done at the reversing valve so that the system can either manually or ma automatically go from heating to cool and vice versa. Defrosting control, um, again, the system will go into a defrost at a preset outdoor air temperature, but it also can be into a forced defrost if necessary. I'll show you how to do that uh, at the uh, when we get into troubleshooting. Oil return, I mentioned this when I showed you the flow chart. Again, if the system's been running at flow, low frequency, low RPM, it just wants to ensure that there's no danger that the compressor would be starred of, starred of oil, so it goes into that oil return feature. High pressure protection. This is a cool one, and I just dropped something here. So I just want to up. There we go. This feature still blows me away. And I think it will do the same for you. Um, if the system experiences high pressure, it will throw an E1 error code at the outdoor unit. But before it does that, all TOSO systems, whether they be Apex or mini split units, guys, one of the extraordinary features of the, Apex, uh, of the TOSO systems is that they try to solve problems <laughs> before letting you know about them. And this is the perfect example of that. If the system's experiencing high pressure, well, the system literally has the capability of controlling the operation, controlling the modulation, controlling the RPM of the compressor. You know that now. You now know how an inverter compressor works. If the, if, if, if the pressure is too high, we could slow it down, baby. And if it's too low, we can, we can do the opposite and speed it up. Now, nine times out of 10, it will resolve internal issues all by itself without our help, without the help of your customer. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing because what I always say about all TOSO products is that they are designed, listen to me now, you want a sales feature, here it is, right? They are designed to avoid nuisance callbacks because if your customer has to go back to Mrs. Gillicuddy to address this, right, that's a loss of profit, right? Because they can't charge her again. This, this, in most cases, they can't charge her again. This is a nuisance issue. But the system tries to resolve it, has the capability. Here is the bottom line. You want an example of artificial intelligence in our industry? Well, there it is, boys and girls, in your face, baby. And this is nothing to be scared of. This is artificial intelligence at its best. And this is a Toso thing, right? Brand M, Brand F, Brand D, Brand LG, all of them. None of them have this algorithm. None of them have this software. Something very, very unique to the Toso product. And again, if the system could not resolve it, the E1 error would be thrown. You can see it being displayed at the LED board of the outdoor unit. But again, I want to stress to you, a lot of old guys like me, right? When, when, when AI first came into our vocabulary, we got scared, right? Uh, <laughs> we thought robots were going to take over the world. And ultimately, that may still happen, but, but not with a Toso product. This is AI, my friends, at its best, seriously. 
Same thing with low pressure control. The same thing happens here. Instead of high pressure, low pressure now, low pressure, we can speed up the compressor to, con to try and compensate for that. Eventually, it won't be able to. I mean, in a low pressure system uh, situation, you probably got a leak, right? And at some point, no compressor is going to be able to compensate for that, and it's going to throw you the E3 error. And then you can see the E3 error being displayed at the outdoor unit. High temperature protection. And when I say high temperature te protection, I'm talking about discharge temperature at the register so that we're not cooking <laughs> Mrs. Gillicuddy. But then there's also a discharge high temperature. And this discharge high temperature function is the discharge of the compressor. You saw that sensor, that thermistor, uh, very early on in the presentation today, where it's literally sensing the temperature of the, of the refrigerant coming out of the compressor. Too hot, we can slow it down. Too cool, we can speed it up. All, again, being able to compensate internally without our help. If it can't, it's going to throw the E4 error. But nine times out of ten, more often than not, it can solve problems without the assistance of a human being. <laughs> Come on, that's pretty cool. And there you see the E4 error being displayed at the LED board of the outdoor unit. Okay, for my friends in Nova Scotia, what custom car show originates from Nova Scotia? Is it chasing classic cars, my friend Wayne Carini? Is it Restoration Garage, Mr. David uh, Granger? Is it the Gas Monkey Garage, uh, Mr. Richard Rawlings? Or is it Bad Chad Customs? Unmute yourself and give me the answer, my friends. Come on. Bad Chad Customs. Thank you. Absolutely. And there is Bad Chad. And he is one bad looking dude. <laughs> I had an opportunity to meet him. I'm, I'm a car guy. Uh, and and something happened, and and I couldn't get to uh, to meet him, but I'm determined. And will you please invite me to Nova Scotia as soon as this COVID thing is over? Because I really want to meet Bad Chad. I mean, I want to work with you and meet you, but I really want to meet Bad Chad. Thank you. Okay, uh, guys, any questions on anything we've talked about so far? Uh, I know we've covered a lot of ground already, and there's still a lot of ground to cover, but. Uh, Anything you, you want to discuss? I, I did get a question from um, from Randy Smith uh, through Microsoft Teams. And Randy, I, I do have your, well, let me see if I have the answer right now. Uh, Wesley Salisbury, who, who you know, is our Toso genius. I, and, and I don't use that word lightly either, but he truly is our Toso genius. Um, Randy, well, Randy's question for everybody was, uh, I believe the suction line on the four and three, uh, four and five ton is three quarter. And that's true for, uh, for both models. It's uh, three quarter. Uh, and he asked, can we use seven eights that we've run? He has run into that issue. And the answer from Wesley is yes, there might be a slight decrease in capacity, but he emphasizes slight. So the good news is yes. Uh, slight capacity loss, possibly, but the good news is that can be done. So thanks for that question, Randy, and, and thanks, uh, Wesley, for that answer. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, anything that you guys want to address before we move on? Really? I'm doing that good a job? <laughs> I have a quick one. Um, I'm just yeah, wondering, no. in terms of the, the systems, are we, like, talking about the new units or is it the same across both models because we have some old stock here as well and i know the new ones arriving this week so i wanted to make sure we're consistent yeah uh so far everything i've discussed is consistent for both there are a few um i don't know if i want to call them features but a, a few new nuances to what i call the gen 2 product and as we move forward, you'll see them come up. Very minor issues. You saw one come up already, and that was the coil sensor of the Gen 2, what I'm calling the Gen 2 Apex indoor unit. That will have a coil sensor in order to keep the fan off before the coil is up to temperature. As I mentioned earlier, how we're doing that now is simply with a delay feature on whatever 24-volt thermostat is being utilized. 
Um, but um, that's the only difference on the indoor unit. You will see a couple of differences on the outdoor unit. I'll address each of them. The good news is they're relatively minor, nothing to be concerned about, but I will point them out to you so that you know it's important that you know what they are. Perfect, thanks. Thank you. If there's nothing else, and again, uh, please, you know how to access me now. Uh, obviously, Randy figured it out through Microsoft Teams, which is wonderful. Uh, but my my email address is just my name, uh, Jerry with a G, G-E-R-R-Y, Wagner, W-A-G-N-E-R, no dots, no hyphens, nothing. Jerry Wagner at abathica.com. And um, yeah, so anything, if you're like me, you, you, you go to these webinars or you go to these in-person um, training events, and you never think of the question until that night when you wake up screaming it in the middle of the middle of the night. Why didn't I ask that? Well, that's okay. Don't don't worry about it. You'll you'll always have access to me moving forward. So with that said, uh, let's move forward. Let's take a look at the installation. Time time to get our hands dirty, right? Everything up to this point was really just observation uh, of, of the indoor and outdoor unit. Now let's actually get into the, uh, installation and we'll start with the indoor unit condensate removal guys. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because there's no need to, there's nothing unique about the condensate removal process here. Um, as you can see, there are connections all three quarter, whether the unit is in the vertical configuration or in the horizontal. Uh, again, three quarter inch connections. I, I don't need to discuss the need for a a P trap, though maybe I should because I I I, I won't name names, <laughs> but Wesley actually sent a picture to me and uh, and all of his uh, tech services guys Dennis and and uh, and Devin and you know Devin is uh, for those of you in Nova Scotia Devin Embry, who's one of our tech services uh, people, he's in your neck of the woods. He's he's in print. Uh, he's in uh, Nova Scotia. So that that's wonderful for you guys. And remember, uh, bad Chad, <laughs> I asked Devin, do you know this guy? Is he anywhere near you? And he said, oh yeah, I went to school with his son, <laughs> with his son. I see him all the time. So another reason I got to get up to, uh, to Nova Scotia, but getting back to the, 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 uh, the P trap, this is my favorite for whatever that may be worth to you. Um, I, I love the rector seal easy trap product mainly for two reasons. It, it, it's clear you can see when it's fouled and it comes with the pro, the brush to clean it when it is fouled. Come on. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And it's very, very easy to use. This is the uh, apex indoor unit. This is the, uh, uh, the uh, four and five ton indoor unit. You can see in a horizontal application, I'll give you some better views of that as we move forward and, and talk about the uh, uh, horizontal application, but you can see here, the rector, Se rector seal easy trap doing its thing. Repositioning of that pan um, when we go to the horizontal position. See, out of the factory, the drain pan is currently in the supply outlet left and return inlet right. So if you're doing this, which is what I did, uh, no need to reposition the pan. But And, and there you is. There, th there's a great visual of the mechanical room here uh, in, in, in the house in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, and again, I, I didn't have to reposition the pan because it is from the factory ready for this application, supply inlet left, return inlet right. But we can do this in the field. We can change it. It's not a big deal whatsoever. Watch the video and then I will describe it in some detail. It really is that simple. Now, all videos kind of oversimplify everything. So let me get into a little bit more of the detail. We need to remove the entire front panel. Now, the front panel consists of a total of five elements. There's the top element and then the bottom portion, uh, again, either uh, three or four uh, sub panels, I think is a good way to describe them but we need to remove all of the sub panels that will expose what I call uh, the brace bar at the bottom of the fan coil. 
if you notice, it's kind of hard to see, but that brace is actually lipped over the vertical pan for two reasons. So in shipping, the coil doesn't move. And also when you're, when you at MCO are manipulating these in your warehouse, and ultimately when your customer's manipulating them at Mrs. Gillicuddy's house, the coil stays in the position that it's intended. But if we want to change the position of that horizontal pan, we need to remove that bottom brace. It's just two screws and that comes off simple and easy. And then the last is the midpoint, what I'll call a horizontal brace uh, at the midpoint of the cabinet. Remove that, and that gives you the ability to do this. That is literally to pull the coil forward, and now you can change that horizontal pan from left to right to uh, have a return inlet right supply outlet left. And again, this is what you are doing out in the field. Very, very simple. Very, very nice design by Toso so that this is field convertible uh, depending upon the horizontal position that the customer wants to use. Really, really nice stuff. Okay, let's take a look at the electric uh, heater kit. And again, there are four of them, 8KW10, 15, and 20. And... A good idea, not necessary, but a good idea to install it before installing the fan coil. It can be retrofitted after the fact. I'll show you that in just a moment. But in the cases where you know you're going to need this, and I got to believe every one of your applications in Canada would call for electric backup, just again, based upon what I know of your climate there. Here in, in, in Pennsylvania, where I don't encounter anything that you guys do, I took advantage of it here. Now, I will tell you this. <laughs> you know, as, as I mentioned to her earlier, you know, these systems, the ultra heat system, the Apex system, capable of rated capacity of heat down to negative 30 Fahrenheit. Now, if it ever gets below negative 30 in central Pennsylvania, it's probably the apocalypse. <laughs> you know, I probably have bigger issues than my Apex not being able to maintain time temperature but that aside i'm ready for the apocalypse baby i put the electric strip in there and that's what we're going to do here we're going to remove that top front cover and then we're going to remove the front top cover uh there's a little half panel if you will that exposes the electrical box now let me go back this is where you can see this blank plate. There's four screws. You can only see three of them. Uh, but this blank plate is where you're going to insert the electric strip kit. So obviously you need to gain access to that. And this is in the way. The electrical box you can see is clearly in the way. No big whoop, people. It's just two screws. There's plenty of slack in the wiring harness going down to the uh, blower motor below. Plenty of slack that will allow you to do what I just did here. Actually move it out of the way. Now, if you're retrofitting, if you're doing this after the fan coil has actually been installed, you're probably going to want to completely move that box out of the way just to give you a little bit more maneuverability. And that's fine. You can do that. To do that, you're simply going to disconnect it at the blower motor. Molex connector, no big whoop, right? But uh, probably going to want to completely move it out of the way to give yourself a little bit more room there. We need to remove that plate. You can see there's four screws that hold it in place. Uh, we remove it, and now you simply take the electric strip and put it into that hole. Uh, you're going to mate up. I have one here. You're going to mate up these two tabs, if you will. That's what you're seeing on the screen right now. Uh, there are going to be two little indentations or holes, if you will, uh, for the, and, and that's just a rear support so that the, 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 the fan, uh, so that the strip isn't just kind of loosely flapping in the wind, literally, right? That it has a rear support structure. So that's what that's there for. Um, this is so hard to describe and I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to do a very good job of it, but I'll, I'll try again. Uh, let me see if I can show it to you. Uh, here they are. On the faceplate of 
the uh, kit, two screws right here, these two. I hope you can see that. They protrude. Can you see that? Well, you have to find a home for them, and we provide a home for them. That home are these two little cutouts, right? Right here. And you, again, I'm not doing a good job describing it, but it's intuitive. That's the good news. You'll know what you have to do when you're doing it, right? You've got to find those two screws. You have to give them a home, and that's the home, right? So that the kit will install flush against that that wall if you will that you're installing it into i know again I'm, i i apologize i'm not doing a good job describing that but once again it's it's intuitive as you do it you now secure the uh the kit in place with the four screws and now it's time to take the breaker supplied with the unit uh all factory wired it's a beautiful thing comes one breaker with the eight and the 10 kW, two breakers with the 15 and the 20. You can see that there's a place provided for the breaker. Another beautiful thing on the part of Toso design, wonderful design engineers at the factory. They also have come up with this, which I absolutely dig to put the breaker in its place and keep it there to make a good solid mount with essentially no tools required, no drilling on your part whatsoever, they came up with what they call a buckle configuration. Uh, this is the buckle. Let me play this video, and, and hopefully you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. By simply uh, moving the buckle with the Phillips head screwdriver is what you're going to ultimately use. You lift it. You lift the buckle. Put the breaker in that frame. Pull the screwdriver out, the buckle closes, and it's there, baby. It ain't going nowhere. It's a really very interesting, simple, but beautiful design, and they call that the, the buckle, and I love it. So that's how you're going to mount that breaker in place, uh, all ready to go. Now, remember where we started, people? Remember where we started? I told you that if you use the electric strip heater, you're going to power it, and you're not going to power L1 and L2 of the indoor unit. Maybe I didn't tell you that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I should have. Uh, yeah, you're going to bring your source power to the breaker. You are no longer going to bring the source power to L1, L2 of the, uh, of the indoor unit. Uh, once again, you'll see what I mean. You make the connection, the Molex connector, of the electric strip to the electrical box, now that, that's your power source. That's your power source for the fan coil. You're powering that breaker. And internally now we took, took care of everything else. Isn't that sweet? I think it's brilliant and it is sweet. So now we just simply put the box, the electrical box back where it belongs. And here's your finished product, guys. You can see the electric strip in place uh, in the discharge airflow. And uh, we are good to go. The last thing we want to do as we reassemble the cabinet, putting the front panels back on, we need to cut out in this example, because this is the 10 KW. Yep. This is the 10 KW that I used. Uh, I just have the one breakers. So I need to knock out the knockout <laughs> provided on the front panel of the apex indoor unit. And now that provides you access to the breaker without having to remove the um, the front cover. Beautiful thing, isn't it? A absolutely. And there, again, is the final product. You're done. Now, again, all of the, one last thing before I move on. Uh, again, this is this is here. You got to tell me when you're looking at my back. I forgot, I forgot to take the, the camera off of my back. You shouldn't be looking at the back of my head. You should be looking at the front of me. But I will go back to this. This is a 20K, I believe, maybe a uh, 15, maybe. Uh, and you can see that there are two breakers provided for the 15 and the 20. So we give you, we give you a second opportunity to... Uh, mount the two breakers and also gain access to them. Uh, maximum overcurrent 
protection for each of the heaters, as you can see there, from 40 to 60. Uh, guys, this is something unique to Canada, so I'm told. If you're utilizing the 15 and the 20K electric strip, there's two breakers, right? But I'm told that the Canadian um, electrical code requires that there be a single connection point for that. You cannot bring it to two separate breakers for one appliance. It needs to have a single uh, connection point, um, single point of power entry, as the header says there. Now, uh, Wesley has provided some part numbers from ProTech and from Square D, where it's essentially a jumper bar uh, that you can put on the two breakers so that you have a single port. I, I, I will say this to you guys. I did this class. I mentioned to you, uh, to you earlier. I did this class for your guys in Quebec uh, at Deluxe Air. Fabulous gentlemen. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I, I always love an opportunity to work with guys like them because I learn and I learned as much as they did, which, and, and, and this was something that they helped me with. They told me, and I don't know if this is unique to Quebec. Maybe you guys can enlighten me here again. They were saying that, um, this single point jumper bar by Canadian code has to be provided by the breaker manufacturer, not by ProTech, not by Square D. Now, I mean, maybe maybe Square D and ProTech make breakers. I don't know if they made this one, but apparently that someone in, of, of an issue that was brought up by those guys, they, they have the answer to it. So if that's a problem for you, I would suggest uh, talking to Daniel or Eves or David uh, out of Deluxe Air in Quebec. Because uh, they have the answer uh, if that's a unique problem for you guys as well. Something that needs to be field supplied when utilizing the electric strip is a uh, a relay, uh, something equivalent to a White Rogers. You're looking at my back again. <laughs> uh, not my bet, not my best side by any stretch of the imagination. Not that I have a good side, but you didn't have to say that. Um, yeah, a White Rogers uh, 184, 912 or equivalent relay. Uh, this relay will not allow the electric strip to operate without the indoor blower operating. Make sense? Yeah, there's you know potential issue there um, if the electric strip is energized and, and we're not blowing air, right? So simply that that's what this is utilized for. And uh, Wes and, and, and Dennis King, uh, one of our other TOSO gurus, uh, came up with uh, this wiring diagram and this option for us. Ah, I hope Bruce is on here. I didn't see his name, but uh, I was excited when, when Bruce Passmore was, was going to participate in this. And he's our, I believe, our only Ontario uh, participant. But Bruce, if you're out there, everybody unmute and give me an answer. In what year did the Toronto Argonauts? win the Grey Cup with Doug Flutie as the quarterback for the first time. My friends, was it 1994? Was it 1996? Was it 1989? Or was it 1999? Give it up. Come on. Tell me. Somebody. Unmute. 94. 94? Ah, close but no cigar. 96 for Mr. Flutie. How many did he win with the Argonauts? I know he won multiple, right? And then he ultimately won one um, with Calgary, I believe. Anyway, I'm, I'm a big um, BC Alliance fan. Don't ask me why. <laughs> well, I will tell you why. Uh, for 33 years, I was a season ticket holder for the New York Jets. And if you know anything about the 33 years, the past 33 years of the New York Jets, my friends, it was a miserable existence. Uh, calling it football <laughs> is giving it a compliment. So I searched for football elsewhere and I went to your country. And seriously, I just, uh, for whatever reason, uh, got uh, became a fan of the BC Lions and also the Calgary Stampeders. Uh, but anyway, that's the discussion for another day. All right, guys, let's learn how to set up the dip switches of the indoor unit. I showed you this picture earlier, and here are the dip switches right there on the indoor control board. 
And as I think I mentioned earlier as well, yes, <laughs> the board is upside down. But just for the ease of describing this to you moving forward, I'm going to spin it around. Now, consider this. Obviously, you don't have the ability to do that in the field. The, the board's upside down, and you can't change that, right? And you probably can't stand on your head. At least I can't. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've never claimed to be the sharpest tack in the box. But what I realized is, yeah, I can't spin the equipment 180 degrees. Uh, I can't spin myself 180 degrees, but I can spin the service manual <laughs> 180 degrees. It took me a minute. Again, I'm not the sharpest tech. It took me a minute, but uh, yeah, <laughs> you just need to spin the manual and then everything kind of lines up nicely. So the indoor unit, you're gonna fit, uh, set the indoor fan speed switch. Now, this picture, is an, another reason I could never claim being the sharpest tack in the box. Because when I saw this diagram in the service manual, I said to myself, wow, that's a lot of dip switches. <laughs> I went looking for 12 sets of dip switches. <laughs> and I'm happy to say I'm not the only guy who has done that, including Wes and Dennis and brilliant people associated with this product. There's only one set of two, right? What you're looking at here is for the two ton, is for the three ton, levels one, two, and three, and for the four ton, and for the five ton, levels one, two, and three. Now, what you're doing here, what you're looking at is the black is the dip switch. Again, it's something that initially and still remains very confusing and will be for your customers, quite frankly. We're working on trying to uh, make this a little bit easier uh, to understand the fir at first glance. At first glance, it's, 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 very, it's not intuitive, right? It's very difficult to see what, what Toso is trying to tell us here. What's the dip switch and what isn't? Well, I made a note here at the bottom of every slide and it says the black is the dip switch. That's the position of the dip switch. So dip switch position, dip switch position, right? That's, that's what I want to show you here. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. Here we have level one for the 48,000 BTU indoor unit. Again, that's what I have here in the house. And for level one, you'll notice that the number two dip switch is in the on position, right? That's the one that is lifted, if you will. Does that make sense, guys? So always know that the dip switch is the black square. I think that's the best way to look at it until we figure out an easier way <laughs> to look at it and to demonstrate it. Absolutely. Um, the heat and the cool a fan speed must match. You can have a different fan speed for heat and a different fan speed for cool. It won't work, baby. <laughs> Nothing works. No fan operation whatsoever. So the heat and the cool uh, fan speed must be identical. Um, someone asked me, I, I don't know if it was Kelsey or who it was, but a uh, young lady asked me about uh, the differences between the Gen 2 and the Gen 1 Apex. Well, well, here's one of the differences. The Gen 2, uh, you will have eight speed settings as opposed to three speed settings. Uh, which is a good thing, all right? N not, not, you know, n nothing that is uh, groundbreaking or earth shattering, but it, it is an advantage to the Gen 2. And you'll see the reason for that. Maybe that's next. Um, yeah, it is next. <laughs> Something I want to stress to you with all Toso product, when, when you're looking for a quick answer, I always suggest going to the middle sheet for that product guys the submittal sheets tosoamerica.com i'll show you how to get there before we leave um looks like we're we're running late uh, you know i i hope we uh finish up by noon eastern standard but if we don't i hope you can hang in there i'll, I'll do my best to speed things up but I, I at the same time i i don't want to go too fast but my my point being here is uh, this is from the submittal sheet the submittal sheet will answer 
I'm going to say 80% of your questions in, in, in a single sheet, sing, double-sided piece of literature. So I always strongly suggest when you have a question, a specification issue, go to the submittal sheet for that product. That's what you're looking at here. You can see what CFM, the three different speeds on that unit will produce. Here's another issue between Gen 1 and Gen 2, my friends. Gen 1, the 2 and the 3 ton, 0.4 external static pressure, the four and the five ton, 0.5 external static pressure. Here's the benefit of the Gen 2, uh, one inch of external static pressure for both models. That's a beautiful thing. <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. So for those, at, you say you have both in stock, so that's okay, not a problem. But where you have a customer that points out to you right out of the gate that uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 ain't going to cut it, well, there's your answer. You're in a unique situation to have both in stock. You're simply going to boost them up to the, to, to the, uh, the Gen 2 model, and away we go. And that will be true across the board for the four capacities, point, uh, or I should say one inch of external static pressure. So what's in the box, my friends? Let's open up the box of the outdoor unit. Um, when we take the front side panel off, we find a goodie bag, uh, but I will admit to you, not many goodies in there. <laughs> not much of anything in there. Uh, we have a drain fitting, which you can insert into the bottom of the outdoor unit, connect 5 8 inch ID tubing to it, and move any precipitation, any condensation, anything uh, that may accumulate in the base pan and move it away from the outdoor unit with 5 8 inch tubing. You would, you have these rubber grommets to fill all the, uh, what I'll just kind of call gravity drain holes or, or, or natural drain holes so that all of the discharge would go through the fitting. All, all of this literature, Mrs. Gillicuddy stuff, you can see what it is, owner's manuals, energy guides, um, just stuff for, you just, just hand that right over to Mrs. Gillicuddy. Um, the service manual and installation manual, tosoamerica.com. Uh, unfortunately, it does not come with the product. I hope that will change. I'm going to do everything I can to make that change. Uh, but for the moment, I think you'll find uh, just this homeowner stuff contained in the uh, outdoor unit. That fitting again, um, you can see it goes into the outdoor unit. I'll show you a little bit more detail as we actually will install it. Prince Edward Island quiz. This is a cool one, I think, anyway. Hey, what province in China is the sister province to Prince Edward Island? I bet you you didn't even know you had a sister province in China. You did because your lieutenant governor a few years back went to China and stayed in this province and made it your sister province in China. I'm not kidding. Look it up. Is it the, pro the Chinese province of Henan? Is it the province of Guangdong? Is it Yunnan, or is it the province of Fujian? Anybody? I, I'd be blown away if somebody knows this. I think I got you stumped, but give it a shot. Is it Guangdong? No, but I, it, that's a good, bad answer. <laughs> that's a good, bad answer. It is not, but Guangdong is where Toso is located. So I'm happy you picked. If you were going to pick a wrong answer, I'm happy you picked one. The answer is Hanan. And if you look at the map here, Henan is actually just south of Guangdong. Uh, it's uh, almost an island, I guess, a little bit like Prince Edward. Oh, there. Okay, it just made sense. See, I'm not the sharpest tack. I just felt my light bulb go on. That's why your lieutenant governor said, hey, I'm on an island here. I'm on an island back home. They, they should be sister provinces. Ah, beautiful. But, yeah, seriously, guys, uh, just above it in mainland China, if you will, Guangdong and specifically the city of Zhuhai is where this product is made. And I'm so happy to be able to say that in July of 2018, uh, I had the opportunity to visit my friends at Toso. They had been to my home in New York many, many times over the years, uh, but never was able to, uh, to go to their home. So before this whole COVID thing, I'm so happy I had that opportunity. And just one of the one of the experiences of a lifetime, quite frankly, a little, little, uh, little fun tidbits of fact there. Okay, guys, uh, we installed the indoor unit. Let's look at the outdoor unit. I think we can move along at a pretty good pace here. Um, 
I always ask our installers, can I ask one favor? I, 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 you know, I've been talking now for what, two and a half hours. I think I've earned a favor. Can we have the outdoor unit be level for one hour? That's all I ask, one hour. After that, I recognize it's out of our hand. God takes over, right? The soil levels, nothing we can do about that. But for one hour, <laughs> we could put a level on it and have that outdoor unit be level. Guys, um, you want another feature, a, another plus, something extraordinary about the outdoor unit of the Apex system? Four inches against the wall. Come on, give it up. That's what makes this product as a universal replacement of an outdoor unit so extraordinary. Um, one of the early markets where this product had, had extraordinary success, the state of California, urban settings, Los Angeles County, where homes are incredibly close to each other, right? Real estate is such a, 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 a prime, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> so valuable. That's the word I'm working, looking for in Los Angeles County, that homes are very, very close together. So a side discharge outdoor unit, universal replacement side discharge outdoor unit that can be as close to four inches to the wall, huge, huge for any urban setting. And I got to believe that that in certainly in, 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 in Toronto, Quebec City, Montreal, uh, that's got to be a winner in those markets as well. The drain connector, again, I'm going to go back to that and just just kind of show it to you in action. Uh, there it is. Comes in the goodie bag of the outdoor unit. We're going to plug up all the existing holes, put it in that singular hole. I, I just want to point out to you that in that hole, when you first look at it, there it, crossing over it, internal to the outdoor unit, is the heating element of the base pan. Not a problem. You can literally move that out of the way. There's enough uh, slack there that you can literally move it out of the way with your finger and insert that fitting if you choose to use it. Now, prior to this product, if you installed that fitting, you had to lift the outdoor unit because once the fitting's installed, it literally is lower, sits lower then the mounting feet of the outdoor unit. And what would happen is it would do a weeble wobble and it would fall down. <laughs> it would literally pivot, if you will, off of the fitting and not land on the four feet. I love this product from my friends at Rector Seal. Uh, they call it the uh, fix it foot. And uh, there it is. And I used it here, right? Uh, I did it for really for one reason you can see the out this is my home you can see the outdoor unit is on um a, a traditional pad two inch uh, you know in in, in depth or, or height i should say no, no big whoop there i didn't ha have a need to use that fitting but i did want to get the outdoor unit above a typical snow line and also, they work as wonderful vibration, an added uh, uh, you know, uh, benefit to it. These are solid rubber curbs, and they act as wonderful vibration isolators. And I got to tell you, this is the guest room window at the house. And my wife was very concerned what, when the outdoor unit would operate that it could possibly wake up our guests. Now, I thought that was a, a, a good thing, not a bad thing, because I want the guests to get the hell out of here as soon as possible. She doesn't. She wants them to, <laughs> she wants them to stay, right? Uh, but uh, I have to say, outdoor unit just absolutely not heard whatsoever. Uh, just they're, they're quiet by makeup, uh, but also with the vibration isolations uh, of those curbs. Really, really nice. All right. Dip switch setup of the outdoor unit. Let's get through that. Pretty simple. Uh, once again, you can see the board is upside down. So just for the ease of describing it to you, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, rotate, rotate that 180 degrees. So once, once again, guys, if you look at this picture quickly and uh, you're like me, you start looking for four sets of dip switches <laughs> there are not four sets of dip switches there is just the one set and it is right here right there on the board so that's all you're looking for and we're going to set 
the capacity with switch number one, right? So for the two ton, we want switch number one to be down. For the three, we want it to be up. Four ton, down. And this is just switch one, mind you. And for the five ton, you can see the switch is in the up position. We got three more to take care of. Oh, well, look at this. I even show it for you. Beautiful thing. So that's what I'm talking about. The switch matching the black square. I think this is helpful. I hope it is. I think it's helpful to have that visual of the actual board for each of the sizes. All right, beautiful thing. Now, we're going to set the defrost mode with switch number two. Uh, the default is the, uh, the factory setting. And that's what you see here, the standard with the switch in the up position. But you can, or your installer can switch it to the strong defrost. What that does, it doesn't increase the number of defrost cycles. doesn't do that at all. It simply takes the number of cycles and elongates them, makes this defrost cycle longer. So that if we do have a um, unusual amount of frost, ice on the outdoor unit, it will give it additional time in order to overcome that. In, in your extreme climates up there, maybe something you want to take a look at and, and, and enable. I say this to you, having said that, wait. Out of the box, don't immediately start moving from the factory defaults, in this case, the standard defrost. If you need it, that can be done after the fact but I strongly suggest keeping it in the standard defrost until further notice, right? Until you decide or until your, your installer, I should say, uh, realizes that it needs that additional time. And that, again, is all done at dip switch two of the outdoor unit. So for standard defrost, it's in the up. For strong defrost, it's in the down position. Beautiful thing. Your service tech can uh, force defrost. Again, all done at the outdoor unit. Something I got to be careful with open bottles of water with all the electronics here. Uh, but I do want to show you this. On the outdoor board, where are the dip switches again? Oh, there we are. The dip switches are here. But you also have the series of three buttons, actually four buttons right here. By manipulating these buttons, there is a variety of things that your service tech can initiate. And one of them is frost, uh, forced defrost. Um, so that's a beautiful thing uh, for our service techs out in the field to know and be able to uh, enable that. Okay, the last two dip switches of the outdoor unit three and four, we are going to set the operating mode. Three modes to choose from. Standard mode, that's the factory default. Strong mode. Strong mode is best described, my friends, in that it will bring the running frequency, the RPM of the inverter compressor, up to a higher frequency, up to a higher RPM quicker than it would in the standard mode. If we want the system to react quicker, right? we can do that by initial uh, enabling the strong mode. Now, the third choice is energy savings, and I caution you here. <laughs> I caution you here because my feeling about the energy savings mode is this. If this system was properly sized to begin with, and I got to make some assumptions. Now, you could say that's a bad assumption to make, but I don't care. I have more trust in our trade, right? I want to believe that someone in this process, right, has, has properly done a heat gain weight loss calculation and knows that this application requires a two, a three, a four, or a five, right, and has sized the equipment accordingly and correctly. That's a professional job, my friends, right? That's what professionals do. Discussion for another day. What I am suggesting here is if the system is properly sized and then the energy savings mode is chosen, um, it's probably not going to hit set point people, right? You're going to be running at a lower capacity, right? 
Now, I had a question come up, brilliant question, again, from your, your, your associates, your counterparts, your compadres up at Deluxeair in Quebec. Uh, I, I think it was Daniel asked me, well, okay, this is beautiful, the energy savings mode. If we have an application for a ton and a half, can we use the two-ton product and put it into energy savings mode? Sounds logical, right? Brilliant question. Brilliant question from a brilliant person. <laughs> I'm working on the answer on that. The, I, I would say, looking at it quickly, scratching on the surface, sounds logical to me, baby. But I do have Wes looking into that with the people from Toso. We, we don't want to commit to that until we know exactly what the duration, if that's a word, is. When you put it into energy savings mode, how far back are you setting that um, that capacity? And still, you have to consider this. Is that even necessary in, in Daniel's question? If we have a system that is a ton and a half requirement, well, you saw the capacity of the two-ton out uh, the two-ton system. It'll give you as little as 8,000 BTUs, baby. So I, I question if we even have to answer that question, right? right? It seems to me the nature of the inverter system will resolve that on its own. But again, I'm going to have some bigger minds uh, give me some more detail on that. And there you can see the dip switch settings uh, for three and four uh, for the standard mode. You can see they're both down. For the strong mode, three is up, four is down. And for the energy savings mode, three is down, four is up. Beautiful. Line set requirements. We're in the home stretch, guys. I promise, I promise. And I'm, I still got a half an hour with you, so we're good. Um, line set requirements. Minimum 15 feet, maximum 98 feet, maximum elevation from the top of the outdoor unit to the indoor unit, 49 feet. Now, 15 feet, if you guys know our uh, mini split product, that's different. Our mini split product, a minimum of 10 feet for each indoor unit, 15 feet here. I will tell you this, the primary reason for the 15 feet is that Toso is concerned anything shorter, you may get a refrigerant velocity noise. Not the end of the world, and depending upon where the equipment is located, maybe not an issue at all. So... This is being recorded, and I don't want to put anything recorded that I have to come back and <laughs> eat crow over later. Uh, but I'm going to suggest to you that there's some fudge factor there. Fair enough. Enough said. Do I need to go any further? No. <laughs> okay. So 15 feet minimum, 98 feet maximum, and 49 feet of vertical elevation maximum. When we talk about 49 feet of vertical app, uh, 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 vertical um, rise, if you will, between the indoor and outdoor unit, in that situation, we would have to trap twice because we're going to have to oil trap. This is only on the uh, gas side. We're going to trap every 20 feet. So if you were at the vertical maximum of 49, you're going to have two traps there, baby, right? Just makes sense. Simple math. Um, and... As you can see in the picture here, this does not matter if the outdoor unit is above the indoor unit and vice versa. You see, with the mini splits, it makes a difference, baby, right? In the mini splits, if the outdoor unit is above the indoor unit, got a trap. That's the only time. But in the apex world, we are trapping no matter what the scenario, whether it's the outdoor unit or the indoor, indoor unit above, if that vertical separation is 20 feet or more, we're trapping, right? Simple as that. Liquid line not required to be insulated. So in retrofit situations where we're just changing the outdoor unit, uh, no need to insulate an uninsulated liquid line. It's a beautiful thing. Recommended flaring tool. Now, again, uh, I'm always going to give it to you straight. I'm always going to tell you uh, the truth, always, um, even if it embarrasses me. <laughs> When I was doing this class for the guys at Deluxe Air, when I talked about a specific flaring tool and I talked about Nylog, uh, they kind of jumped on me a little bit. <laughs> Their exact quote was, Jerry, 
It doesn't matter what flaring tool. Actually, they talk a lot like New Yorkers in Quebec. Have you noticed that? They said, Jerry, no matter what the flaring tool, as long as it's a 45 degree, as long as a proper flare is made, they don't need a special flaring tool and nylog. Well, you know what? I can't argue with that, and, and I'm not, right? But everybody doesn't have the same level of skill, right? You see, as a trainer, I have to try and consider everyone's level of skill. Some people are highly skilled. I'd like to think I'm in that category, quite frankly. And some people are new to the business. Some people have never done a flare before. And I have to consider them as well. And the formula that I have discovered to create a flare that will not cause a leak, that will not cause a, a chargeback, a, a, a return to that job site, is utilizing the, the Lux 45 flaring tool by Yellow Jacket. Why that flaring tool? It has a stop. It literally, do I have it here? I don't have it here. It literally has a stop that if used properly will not allow you to over flare. It's a beautiful thing. Now, as soon as I say that, I have to back up and say, you know, idiots try real hard, right? It, if if they push the stop out of the way, well, then it's a flaring tool like all others and you can over flare. But if you use the stop as it's intended, it literally will not allow you to over flare. The second element is Nylog. I had a video for you guys, but you, you're not hearing the audio, so I'm, I'm not going to play you the video. But uh, if you're not familiar with Nylog, uh, Refrigeration Technologies is the company that makes it. You can go to their website, watch the video. Uh, a big fan of, of Nylog is me, have been for years, but also uh, your friend up in Canada, uh, Gary McCready uh, of the HVAC know-it-all. I love that he loves it, right? Um, and he's an influencer in this industry and, and, and in your market specifically. So uh, check out Nylog. I think you pro guys probably got it on your, on your uh, shelves, but if you don't, you may want to consider it. Refrigeration Technologies Nylog. This is another product that I got turned on to. Um, my friends at Rector Seal uh, came up with this product. They call it the Flare Tight. For lack of a better description, it's a gasket that goes in between the two mechanical elements of the flare. Now, guys, I'm going to tell you this. I I tried this product, used it on a Toso VRF system that I installed in my shop in New York before we sold it. Um, and the sole reason I used this product was because guys were asking me about it. Right? They were asking me what my opinion was if 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 Toso would endorse it. So I felt obligated that I had to use it, and I did. And I used it with great success, just like I've used Nylog. But I will tell you this. Um, if you're going to use the flare tight gasket, listen to me now. You must, you must, you must torque to the correct factory specification. Because if the guy does not use a torque wrench and over torques, you know, he's the guy in the crew with the Kung Fu grip. <laughs> <laughs> right? And he just keeps on going until he can't go anymore. It's literally going to destroy that gasket. And it goes from being a gasket to a leak, literally. Uh, and I've, I've done that. I did it purposely myself because I wondered what would happen. So torquing is required is, is, is a good idea. The reason why most guys don't do it is because they don't own a torque wrench. I have own a torque wrench since I was in the eighth grade but not a torque wrench that was any valuable to uh, any value to me here. I, I'm a car nut, uh, a motorhead and have been since the little, <laughs> I was really, really little. So I've had a torque wrench for automotive purposes for years. But those of you who may be watching this know that that does nothing for us here because an automotive torque wrench connects to a socket. You can't put a socket on a flare, right? Uh, so you have to get something like this. Um, this is the yellow jacket. See, this is this is very much like an automotive uh, torque wrench, uh, but instead of taking a socket, it takes these open-ended uh, attachments, which is beautiful. This is my favorite. I have to admit, um, the uh, Black Max by uh, CPS. 
my absolute favorite, number one, because it's a crescent wrench, right? One tool, no attachments required. It will handle any, any size flare nut and you literally, literally dial in your torque requirement. Uh, just so easy to use, really, really helpful. Uh, they're not the only ones in town now. My, my friends at, uh, at JB Industries, they have one. Again, more similar to what you saw with the, uh, the yellow jacket where there are attachments. But the bottom line is, guys, you should be insisting that uh, guys who are new to the business, if they don't have one of these, you should be insisting that, uh, that they buy one from you. And I hope you, you guys stock one of them. The ProFit Quick Connect from my friends at Rector Seal. Guys, I'm, I'm going to tell you my initial reaction to the ProFit Quick Connect. And do you know what I'm talking about, guys? That's these. I know I got one here somewhere. I just got to find it. Uh, what did I do with it? What did I do with it? Uh, I thought I had one. I know I have one. Where is it? Oh, well. I don't know what happened to it, but that's it. Uh, these shark bite type fittings, if you will, guys. Now... I'm 60. I'm going to be 61 years old in March. I'm an old man. Whenever I see products like this, I'm going to be honest with you. My first reaction is to cringe. <laughs> and this was no exception. I cringed because I worked hard to learn this trade. Your customers worked hard. You worked hard. I'm not minimalizing that at all. You worked hard to learn this trade. And I just see these products, my friends, and, and I feel like we're dumbing down this, this beautiful trade of ours. But that's a 61-year-old man talking, right? That's, that's the Geico commercial, I've become my father, right? The reality of it is, once I get beyond that, I recognize the value of these types of products. And, and the value here is time savings, right? I mean, incredible time savings. I did my entire apex installation here at the house my entire ex uh, without a single well i i was going to say without a single flare i take that back i had to make two flares and that was at the three quarter inch connection at the indoor and outdoor unit why because uh rector seal has yet to come out with a three quarter by thread connection you can see that they have it for the three eighths but they don't have it for the three quarter so that was the only two flares I needed to make. And people, here's the bottom line. Works beautifully. Hold, held 500 PSI of nitrogen. Uh, held a, a vacuum down to 500 microns. And the bottom line is holding the refrigerant and the system runs beautifully. So, you know, uh, this is technology and, and I accept it and I love it. And, and I've become a big fan of it, to be honest with you. All righty, we move along. Now, something unique, guys, about the smaller of the two outdoor units, PEX outdoor units, uh, Apex outdoor units, the valving is inside. To get to the valving, you have to remove the cover, and you have to use one of the knockouts to bring your tubing into it. Now, that said... Anybody with a bending tool who knows how to use it can overcome this. This is not a big deal. But again, I have to consider all the different skill levels. And that's why I recommend this product. Again, a product of my friends at Rector Seal, but the Versatec makes uh, a, an exact similar product as well. Uh, they call them no, Rector Seal calls them no kinks. Uh, this is the 3 8 it's available in the three quarter as well. And it just makes life a lot easier when you got to get into that cabinet, right? I will tell you this, it is here in that wall. You can see the indoor unit here, the uh, multi ultra uh, 42,000, which is both cooling and heating, not only for the, the uh, studio here, but for the, uh, the area below, this is a two story building. Uh, I will tell you, it's in the wall that you see right there, right? Again, 
Why? Because it just made my life easier. That's all. I just made my life easier because I had to get into a crawl space. I think you can see the crawl space a little bit over there. Uh, I can I could get into that crawl space uh, just a lot easier. One thing I've learned, you know, even as an old man, there's nothing wrong with making your life easier when you can. And that's what these products do. I love Rector Seal. I love the Versatech because they're companies that their 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 business model is to help the installer to help your customers. Um, so take advantage of their products, guys. Hey, look, I, I you know, I, I, I got no dog in this race, whether you sell Rector Seal or Diversitech, your business. But I would suggest you take a look at them because they got some really cool products that help in the accessory side of, of these systems. Leak test. We're going to leak test with nitrogen, but remember, where we started today, I told you that the indoor coil as well as the outdoor coil charged, not with nitrogen, but with R410A. So all we are leak testing, think about this, my friends, all we are leak testing is the line set. We don't have an open end on either side. Both sides of that, of, of that line set is closed because the coil on either side is charged. So all we are pressure testing is the line set. Again, the beauty of the Apex indoor unit is that we can start this process either at the indoor or the outdoor unit in the relative comfort of the basement of the structure, which is beautiful. And we need to pressure test each of those line sets separately. Why separately? Well, again, we don't have an open end on either end, right? So each of them has to be done separately. 500 PSI. That's what we're doing here, the three-eighths liquid and then the three-quarter gas for, uh, look, do you need to do it for an hour? I'd love for your customer for, to do it for an hour, but nobody knows the concept of time is money better than me. After 23 years as a successful uh, owner, contractor, service tech in New York and New Jersey, like I say, no one knows that concept better than me. In this business, in our business, time is money, baby, right? So do we need an hour? Look, again, all we're charging, all we're leak testing is the line set. If you hold 500 PSI for 15 minutes, move on, move on. We're good. If you got a leak at 500 PSI, as long as the line set ain't buried somewhere, you got a good chance of hearing it, baby. I mean, that's why manufacturers require 500 PSI, right? Uh, Really, for that reason, that nine times out of ten, if you got a leak at 500 psi, you're going to hear it. And that this is your best diagnostic tool, your your ear. Okay, we move on. Evacuation. Now, this I'm going to take a minute with you, because I think you guys at Emco may have the most important position <laughs> in having evacuation done properly. Because I'm here to tell you evacuation nine times out of 10 is completely done wrong. Even guys who think they've been doing it and know it like the back of their hand, it's right. I've been doing it wrong for years, right? It's a big statement. Right? It's a statement that could get me in trouble, but I don't care, right? Because I know it to be true. I did it wrong for many years. And the reason why most of the industry does it wrong is because they're using the wrong tools. They're using their standard, uh, gauge set, your standard manifold and gauge tubing, right? And why did they do that? Because they look at their gauge and the gauge goes into a vacuum, right? Well, why would it go into a vacuum if I couldn't use it for, for evacuating? Well, <laughs> here's why. That gauge, that hose was never intended for evacuation. I don't care what the gauge says. It was never intended for evacuation. First of all, number one, look at the diameter of the standard hose. Very, very small. And number two, the white, the yellow, the red. You know those hoses are porous? Nobody knows that. They are. The, mole the molecular makeup of that hose, it was never designed to hold pressure for any length of time. It was a service instrument, right? So you need to find the product that is designed, specifically designed for evacuation. Once again... The beauty of the Apex system, when you utilize the indoor unit, they have a choice. They can do the evacuation from either indoors or outdoors. And I strongly recommend 
that you guys start selling one of these products. And guys, please, I, I, again, I, I, I didn't lie to you when I started this. I'm not a salesperson. I have no agenda here. I got no dog in the race, no dog in the fight. You know, I, this is just my experiences over the years. I found a couple of products that are beautiful and designed specifically to do evacuation right, number one, and quick, number two. And that is the Super Evac Manifold by um, Yellow Jacket. And then there's this also this product. And I can't remember. I, I think it's called the Evacuator. And this is from uh, the people at JB Industries. It's cool because it comes with this really nice canvas bag so that you can keep everything in one place. Let's take a look at it. The beauty of these Y fittings that come with this, uh, I think it's called the evacuator. Don't hold me to that. Um, these Y fittings allow you to do this. Look at this. Because we had to pressure test each line set separately. Again, we don't have an open end on either end. Each coil is, is charred. As a result, we have to leak test separately. We also have to evacuate se test separately. But the beauty here with that, with that U-shaped fitting, I can do both line sets simultaneously. You want to save time on a, a process that has always been a time eater, that has, has always been a profit eater? Well, here it is, right? Isn't that a beautiful thing? We can evacuate both line sets simultaneously. I also recommend pulling the core of the Schrader valve, right? Pulling the core of the Schrader valve. Uh, and that's not nothing, nothing you, you guys know that, but having a valve that will allow you to pull that core. And again, these, these fittings come with this product from JB industries that will expedite the process of evacuation. And lastly, a good digital micrometer right now, the one that comes one comes with, uh, the, uh, the product from JB industries, you can see it here. That's the perfect world. The perfect world is you want that gauge to be as close to the fitting as possible. This is the imperfect world. Uh, you know, they only come with one gauge because, quite frankly, JB Industries never heard of the Apex product, right? Where we are doing both of them independent of each other, both line sets independent of each other. And to do it simultaneously, we need we would need two meters. Uh, but I had I have many micrometers and this is the imperfect world. It's fine, but it's not the perfect world. Again, a hose not designed for a vacuum, right? And the gauge a fair distance from the source of the vacuum. This is ideal. This is not. Look at the size of the hoses, guys. Again, the physical dimension, the diameter, very different, much larger than what comes on a standard manifold gauge set. And also look, it's not red, yellow, or blue, right? The molecular makeup of this hose is that it is not porous. It is designed to hold a vacuum, right? That's uh, 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 the beauty of that product. And there you can see the entire kit at use and it cuts down evacuation. Listen to me now. This is a strong statement. It cuts evacuation down by 50%. Time down by 50%. Come on. Beautiful thing. We want to evacuate down to 500 microns. Lower is better, but all Toso is looking for is 500 microns. Me being an old man and something I was taught years ago, the lower the number, the deeper the vacuum, the deeper the vacuum, the better. I go to 100. But don't do that. Don't tell your customers to do that. All we need to do is 500 microns. The difference between 500 microns and, and 100 could be an hour. You know, and that's utilizing this equipment. Utilizing what most guys do, it could be hours. It will be hours. So 500 is the magic number for Toso, so that's all we need. All right, a New Brunswick quiz. What is the official provincial bird of New Brunswick? Is it the robin? Everybody un un unmute. Is it the robin? Is it the black-capped chickadee? Is it the pterodactyl or is it the dodo? What say you people? Chickadee. Chickadee. 
It is the chickadee. Absolutely. And you know what? You guys got to come down here and get your birds. We've got more of these things than you have. And I can also tell you, we got more of your geese than you have. Got I don't know what you guys are doing up there, bringing them all down here. But come and get your, your birds, would you please? <laughs> but I will say, you don't need to get the chickadee. No one's ever complained about the chickadee. But the geese are a pain in the behind. <laughs> come and get them. You can have okay. the geese, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I knew that. Yeah, that's why they're here. Absolutely. Okay, guys, charging. And again, I promise you, we're we're in the home stretch here. Ah, I'm gonna run a little late, so uh, I'll I'll do it as quickly as I can. We are pre-charged out of the box to 25 feet. So the outdoor unit, listen to me now. The outdoor unit pre-charged out of the box to 25 feet. We need to add an additional charge only if we go beyond 31 feet. Why 30? If we're pre-charged to 25, what, what's the deal? Why 31 feet? Well, that's if we're utilizing the Apex Indoor unit. Remember the Apex Indoor unit is charged, remember, right? I, I hope I have that burned in your brain. In fact, you're going to walk home tonight going, Indoor unit pre-charged, Indoor unit pre-charged, Indoor unit pre-charged. And that's a good thing. I want that to, <laughs> I want that to happen. Uh, maybe not the nervous tick, but you know what I mean. Yeah, because the indoor unit is charged. So anything between 15 to 31 feet, you're good to go, baby. You're all set to go. Now, you can go beyond 31 feet. I told you that already. I told you you can go as far as 98 feet. And if you do, you are going to add 0.32 ounces of R410A for every additional feet. Again, not to exceed 98. So let's go back. The outdoor unit, this is the, uh, the, the, the four and five ton. The outdoor unit comes pre-charged to 13.8 pounds of R410. That equates to 25 feet. Right, there you go. The indoor unit comes pre-charged to 0.55 pounds. That equates to what? Six feet, if you do the math here, right? So anything, if you're util utilizing the two pieces of equipment as a system, anything between 15 to 31 feet, you're good to go, right? But you can go to 98 feet, and if you do, again, you're going to add 0.32 ounces for every additional foot, not to exceed 98 feet. And it will be weighed in, weighed in. Much what we do in our mini split world, this is an inverter system. Inverter systems require, I don't care who makes it. Right? This is not a TOSO thing, my friends. I don't care who makes it. All inverter systems, whether they are mini split or now unitary, all inverter systems, by the nature of what they are, require the charge to be weighed in. Right? It's the only way it could be done possible. Quickly, guys, uh, the electrical, we'll start with the low voltage. Um, there is our connection from the indoor unit to the thermostat. Nothing extraordinary there. Uh, we, we have five wire connection and we are good to go. Uh, there is a, a really nice um, wiring diagram made by our uh, Dennis King for us uh, where you see the connection from the thermostat to the indoor unit and then our communication circuit, what I call our communication circuit from the indoor unit to the outdoor unit, right? Y being our compressor, B being the reversing valve. Remember, energized in the heating mode. W is the electric kit. If we're utilizing it, R24 volt, C 24 volt common, and G is our um, signal for the blower motor indoor unit to operate. If we're going to, here's another note for you guys, giving you a heads up, take a note. If your customer is going to use an optional aftermarket uh, float switch, it must break the Y terminal. It is more common to break the R. Don't do it. Won't work. Won't work. Won't stop the system, right? What will stop, stop the system is breaking the Y terminal. So, uh, that's something to remember for sure and something to make sure that your, your customers are aware of. Aftermarket uh, float switches, necessary code by in many cases, if not all cases, but it has to break the Y terminal. And again, there's your uh, low voltage connections of the outdoor unit. There they actually are. Ooh. There they actually are uh, in the piece of equipment. The 230 volt wiring. There's your circuit breaker capacity requirement. For the two outdoor units, uh, same for the two indoor units. Guys, um, the Apex equipment can operate normally within, not within, 
sorry about that spelling within the range of 90 to 100 percent of rated voltage so what does that mean right it means you're good for 10 percent plus or minus right? i'll be honest with you you're a little bit better than that but we want to be conservative right but uh so that's what that's saying as long as we are within 10 percent plus or minus of the rated voltage requirement 230 208 230 we're good to go right <clears throat> very important maybe the most important thing i say to you today maybe the most important thing that you say to your customer when you start talking about any inverter system this is not unique to toso this is not unique to apex this is unique for any inverter system listen to me now Proper grounding for inverter-based equipment is very important for several reasons. First and foremost, safety, right? This is the reason why th this structure, why the electrical service in this structure is grounded, so that when I do this, <laughs> I don't become the ground. Because if I become the ground, I'm going to be on the floor, or worse. <laughs> right? I mean, I get up off the floor. But something we don't consider and need to consider about proper grounding when it comes to all inverter systems, listen to this. Less obvious is that the compressor and the inverter-based equipment operates on a DC voltage. I told you that, people, right? I told you. In an alternating circuit, no current flows through the ground. But in a direct current circuit, all current returns through the ground. People, that sentence is in red because that is happening in every inverter outdoor unit. I don't get, again, I don't care who makes it. Brand M, brand F, brand D, brand LG, brand Toso, right? That is happening in any piece of equipment that has the word inverter in its description. The grounding system is the reference point for all computer logic-based equipment, like all inverter equipment. All inverter equipment, by the nature of what they are, are computer logic-based equipment. Listen to this now. Within computers and computer-based equipment, the internal computer circuits and data cabling connections use the ground as its reference point. My friends, if we have an unstable or worse yet, a non-existent ground, we are going to create problems. The system is going to experience problems that at first blush, at first observation, your, your contractor, I don't care how good they are, are going to be freaked out. They're going to be saying, All right, you know what, uh, Emco, you better send me another one of those uh, control boards because this thing's going crazy. Ah, and I guarantee you, they'll put another board in and it'll do the same thing. Guys, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to move on. But proper grounding is so critical with any inverter system. I'm still learning your electrical codes up in Canada. The, the fellas in Quebec told me that, see, here in the United States, the only source of residential grounding has to be a ground rod, a physical rod, and now two, quite frankly, right? Certain distance apart, two quite uh, two are required going into the ground. That 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 that's your 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 ground rod. That's what's required here in the United States. They told me something that surprised me very very much. That what is required or still allowed, let's put it that way, what is still allowed in Canada is utilizing the home's copper plumbing system as your grounding electrode. I, I, it blew me away. still blows me away. Um, and I'll tell you why. That was fine up in, until 1987. What happened in 1987 was the international plumbing code allowed for PEX tubing. You know what I'm talking about, cross-link polyethylene tubing, right? The same tubing that you guys and I put in concrete slabs and, and floor joists for years for radiant floor heating purposes in 1987 was then approved for plumbing. And plumbers were now integrating plastic tubing into their copper systems. My friends, were we grounded anymore? Eh? Mm, hell no. Hell no. So that surprised me that that is still something allowed in Canada. And uh, we'll see. You know, I, again, I, I'm learning, but... Uh, that, that would concern me, to say the least. There's your L1, L2 uh, of the, uh, the indoor unit. Again, we're only utilizing that. We're only bringing our source power to L1 and L2 of the indoor unit if we are not using the electric strip. If we are using the electric strip, we're bringing power to the breaker provided with the electric strip, whether it's one or two 
breakers. And there is our power to the L, to the outdoor unit, L1, L2, and ground. That's our 208, 230 volt power source to the outdoor unit. The thermostat, um, the beauty is that with the Apex system, it's a 24 volt control circuit. So whatever you wish, whatever the homeowner owner wishes, whatever the installer wishes within reason. I mean, it has to be a 24 volt, but it can be everything that you see here. This is the, uh, this is the unit I actually installed. Well, actually, yeah, it, I, I, I did in, install a new thermostat with the system and I use this, you know, this is the 2022 version of the T87F. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not a mercury bulb or anything like that. It's much more sophisticated, but it is probably the simplest Honeywell uh, digital thermostat on the market. Nothing fancy there. Having said that, though, it does give me it does give me programmability, which I don't like, and I I I I don't enable it. But it also allowed me to set compressor uh, cycle uh, numbers, uh, which I set it to. The longer the cycle, the better with with inverter compressors. Again, something we could talk about in, in, in more detail at another time. Everybody loves the nest, right? So yeah, sure, whatever, right? I, I, again, I sometimes I, I think these uh, nests and things like it are gizmos and gadgets and smoke and mirrors. And I, again, me being an old man, I admit, but anyway. Um, and there's your low voltage wiring. Once again, thermostat to indoor, in, indoor unit and indoor unit to outdoor unit. Troubleshooting, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really put this into high gear because I know I'm pushing your patience and, and, and going a little bit beyond. I told you, uh, well, no, I didn't tell you this. I told you we, we can do a forced defrost, but we can also do a forced operation. We can force the system to come on. If there's something preventing it, a thermostat, whatever it may be, preventing the system from coming on, we can attempt to force it to come on. Again, utilizing the three buttons of the uh, control board of the outdoor unit. There's your error codes. If you're familiar with the error codes of our mini split product, almost identical. I say almost, not, not completely the same, but most of the big ones like E1 is high pressure. E1 is high pressure, whether it's a mini split, Toso mini split or an apex system. So uh, many of the error codes, um, identical, uh, but not all of them. I point out to you F2, F3, F4, and F6. Those are the thermistors of the outdoor unit. Each thermistor is a beautiful thing, my friends. Each thermistor has its own unique error code. So your customer will never find himself or herself in a scenario where uh, they're potentially oming out four different sensors to find the one in, 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 in error. No, 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 no. The error code will always take you exactly to the sensor that is amiss, to the sensor that is failing. Beautiful thing. Beautiful thing. And uh, once again, we can test the resistance. At each of those sensors, uh, there are their values. That we have a 15K, we have a 20, we also have a 50K as well. Uh, there they are. I showed you this slide earlier. There they are coming off the main control board. There is your uh, outdoor heat exchanger sensor, uh, and there is your resistance chart for it on page number 112 of the service manual. There's your outdoor ambient temperature sensor. That is a 15K sensor, and it too, or, or I should say, its resistance values on page 110. And lastly, the discharge temperature sensor, a 50K sensor, and those values are stated uh, beginning on page 114 of the service manual. So again, as I mentioned earlier, the service manual, really the Bible, right? Uh, so much, 80% of, uh, of your questions specification wise technical questions about the product will be answered from a submittal sheet but the bible uh, the nitty gritty the nuts and bolts the service manual for sure and again uh when the system is running beautifully and everything is hunky dory and everything is happy uh it's hard to see there but that actually says on uh what the led screen is is showing is on uh hard to take a a, a still picture of it uh, because it has a pulsation to it, uh, and uh, the frame uh, per second of the camera does not match the uh, the pulse of the uh, the LED, which is very typical. Uh, so it's just hard to get a still picture of it, but it actually says on. There's your service manual, uh, and there is an example of what you would find, the E1 high pressure. All of our diagnostic charts, all of the, the TOSO diagnostic charts, I love are in this drop-down ladder chart. 
for me and for most people, it's just very easy to use it. You're kind of working like you would a ladder, working your way from the top to bottom, going through voltage tests, going through resistance tests, probably changing a component somewhere along the way. But by the time you get to the bottom of the ladder, if all went according to plan, the system is up and running again. And again, that is where that E1 would be displayed on the outdoor board, the LED screen of the outdoor board. If the outdoor board is ever replaced, highly unlikely, but just telling you it, it, it could happen. If the outdoor board is ever uh, required to be replaced, there is one item which must be salvaged from the old board and back to the new board, and that is a jumper. That is where the jumper would go. You can see this is a brand new replacement board. So there's a receptacle for the jumper, but there's no jumper. You would have to salvage the jumper from the existing board and bring it to the new board. What that jumper does, guys, is it gives the new board its identity. In, in this case, it would say, oh, OK, I'm, uh, I'm an Apex 48. Beautiful. Let's go. <laughs> right? it, it gives the board its identity. Uh, so don't forget to make sure if you sell a replacement board, please point that out to your customer. So quickly, some things to, just in recap, some things to remember. Toso Apex Indoor Unit A-Coil is factory charged with R410A, not nitrogen. Don't release it. You are only pressure testing, evacuating, and charging the line set. If you're installing the electric strip heater, you bring the power to the breaker supplied with, with the heater. You only go to L1 and L2 of the indoor unit if the electric kit is not being used. The reversing valve energized in the heating mode. If you don't run a line set equal to the pre-charge, 31 feet, you do not need to remove refrigerant. That's a TOSO thing. And that's true for either mini split or Apex. One of the design features of the Apex and the multi-zone outdoor units of, of the, the mini split world, two accumulators. Now, if you remember early on when I showed you that flow chart with all the components, one of the accumulators is actually called the flash tank. Tomato, tomato. It's semantics, people. I, you know, I don't care what you want to call it, right? But that flash tank, that second accumulator, if you will, gives any unused ref uh, refrigerant a place to go. This is huge, my friends. Your, your installers are going to love the fact that that's taken off their plate during commissioning. Installers have a lot to worry about when they're commissioning a system, and, and they don't have to worry about that. And that's unique to Tosa. That is very unique to Tosa. And there that is. There to the left is accumulator number one. To the right, accumulator number two. Again, to the right, you want to call it a flash tank? Fine. I don't care what you call it, right? But it's another accumulator. Absolutely. Another thing to remember, utilizing an optional aftermarket flow switch, we break the Y terminal. Another thing to remember, listen now. If the outdoor temperature is less, is below zero degrees Celsius, or 32 degree Fahrenheit. Did you hear me now? I'm going to say it again. If the outdoor temperature is below zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit before running that system, we need to preheat the compressor for eight hours. All right. Now, having said that, if the unit is stored in a heated building like your warehouse, I know your warehouse probably isn't heated, but it's not outdoors, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, you, you do have human beings working there. So I'm sure it's, you know, 62 degrees, even if it's 58 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what I'm talking about. You can shorten that preheat time to two to three hours. It's huge, right? Again, that's the advantage of working with a company like Emco, right? Come on, you know, pat yourselves on the back, right? You guys have inventory and you take care of that inventory. Seriously. After a significantly long power outage, it is recommended to preheat once again. Hey, I'm just, it's, I'm just giving you the facts, ma'am. <laughs> right? Just the facts. Again, uh, this is only in situations where it would be low zero Celsius. Um, but I have to bring that to your attention. The cover for the outdoor fan, uh, excuse me, the cover for the outdoor valving. Uh, look at that. Take a good look at that. Um, that can accumulate water. It will hold water. There's no question about it. It's not open-ended at the bottom. So this is what I do. I take it off and I drill a drain hole at the bottom. No big whoop. 
we're going to try and have the factory supply that. We're also going to try and have the factory supply a cover that is the same color of the jacket of the outdoor unit. Isn't that obnoxious? It's, it's just something so simple uh, that could have been, that didn't need to be. We Give me a gray cover, please. It, it draws your eye to it because it's a different color than the jacket of the outdoor unit. Hey, look, is it even necessary? No, you don't have to use it at all. But I like it there. I like the fact that the valves are covered, but there should be a drain hole and the color should match. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, as I mentioned to you, if you use a third-party A-coil, which is fine, just make sure it has a TXV. Uh, use a, um, a filter dryer um, and flush uh, it, it, the line sets. If you're replacing an outdoor unit where there has been a compressor failure. Again, I don't think anything unique about that recommendation. We're going to have an A-coil for you guys, and you know what? We got it. <laughs> well, I think we got it, or we're going to have it. Uh, yeah, uh, there it is. We'll have the four different sizes, uh, four different capacity sizes, just a, uh, just an eight coil. So for your dual fuel applications, uh, which I know is big up there, uh, we will have that product for you. If it's not already in stock, it's on the way, right? Something, uh, my friend and your friend, uh, Dev from M M Cohen. please don't ask me to say Deb's last name. And Deb, if you're on, on the line, I apologize. I can't pronounce your last name, uh, but you're Deb. There's only one Deb. You know, it's kind of like Cher, right? Deb, <laughs> I think you all know who I'm talking about. Dev turned me on to this software uh, product from NRC Can, uh, or NRCAN, I guess, uh, which will size a heat pump system for you. And, and he and I were involved and continue to be involved on a project uh, there in Ontario, uh, Net Zero Homes, Net Zero Homes, and uh, Dev gave a presentation utilizing the results of this sizing software, which is available, which will blow your mind. Give Dev a call, ask him to send it to you, it will blow your mind. Uh, you want proof to show to a customer what a system will do? He got it, and that, that software system does it really and there it is uh, that that's what i'm talking about so uh you guys are very unique having that that kind of talent with dev number one and having uh a a, a um, uh, having this uh, type of software available to you for free i believe yeah all right who do you call when the fat hippie guy from pennsylvania isn't available <laughs> well that number will get you one or all three <laughs> of our tech services people, Wesley Salisbury, Devin Embry, and Dennis King. Uh, Dennis is down here in the States with me. He's in Georgia. Dennis Embry up there with you in uh, Nova Scotia. And uh, Wesley, oh, Wesley back here. Uh, Wesley, uh, Wesley was up in New Brunswick for a number of years, but uh, Wesley is now back uh, with me in Pennsylvania as well. The bottom line, you know, all on Eastern Standard Time, <clears throat> and uh, they're here to help. And just wonderful, wonderful talents. Am I biased? Of course I am. But I can tell you guys, as a contractor for 23 years, I called all these support lines over 23 years. And um, I am so proud of our technical services people and their capability and their talents and skills. Take advantage of it when you need it. TulsaAmerica.com, guys. You can click on Professionals. And then you can click on Library Pro. And that will bring you to our library. Uh, all of our manuals are here. Please write this down, people. If you don't have, it is password protected. And that is the password, just as you see it. No caps, TOSO slash dealer slash VIP, all in lowercase. That password will get you into the uh, library. And then you can view download, send, whatever you need to do, any of the manuals that I um, mentioned and referenced today. So Library Pro, Toso Dealer VIP, and you're in, all at tosoamerica.com. We do have an error code uh, wizard, which uh, I want to start working on improving. It's good. It's good. Uh, the, the customer, your customer, you can simply uh, dial in uh, your error code, and it will give you the uh, corresponding 
uh, diagnostic chart from the appropriate service manual. But quite frankly, I want to do better than that. I'm going to start creating some uh, one minute videos, one minute or less for each uh, for resolution for each error code, which I think will be uh, easier to utilize for your customers out in the field. Training while well, you're getting it, but please, guys, please, once this COVID thing, and, and if you're in a part of Canada that restrictions would not prevent me from coming and visiting, please have me. Let's do that. I'll give you an example. Um, MCO BC contacted me just yesterday. They can't have a, a physical meeting with customers there, but they can have me do this in person with their people, and, and I want to do that. As much as I enjoyed today, and I hope you did too and got value out of it, there's nothing better than to be physically in front of you. So I hope I get that opportunity. Uh, and, and, and if COVID allows, please get me there sooner than later. Than later, I am ready to go. I am Just so that you know, and, I, and I'm happy to share this with you, I am double vaccinated and boosted, and I can prove it, and I need to prove it in order just to get on a plane to go to Canada. So uh, on my end, no problem at all. Please invite me. Would love to be there soon. The Duck Free Zone, guys, it's in a number of publications, but uh, you could always catch my articles on my LinkedIn profile. So many of you have uh, connected with me on, on LinkedIn. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm not a numbers guy. I, I don't care how many hits I get, how many friends I got. It's not like Facebook. I could care less. I just post information related to this product and this technology virtually on a day-to-day -day basis on LinkedIn. And I want to share that with you. you. You are the guys who should be viewing that and enjoying that, hopefully enjoying it, using it. Uh, so that's why LinkedIn is important. And, and I thank you guys for uh, connecting with me there. <laughs> Lastly, hey, a couple of weeks of isolation with the family. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you remember The Shining, a whole a whole lot went wrong with that family when they were in isolation. All right, my friends, I ran a half an hour late. I apologize to you. I know how valuable your time is. Hopefully, I did not squander it. Hope, hopefully, you don't feel like I squandered it. Uh, I, I think a lot of information uh, was exchanged here. Good information, I hope. 